successful homestand for the Mets will become even more so if they pick up a win tonight. Philadelphia and the Mets wrap up their two games. Set a pair of right-handers on the hill. Brent Myers squares off against Matt Ginter on an overcast, humid, cool evening here at Shea Stadium. The Mets 5-2 thus far on the homestand, including a win last night over Philadelphia. Combine that with a Florida loss, and the Mets are just two games out of the top spot in the National League East as they come in with a mark of 23 and 22. They Mets have been playing great ball lately. They've won nine of their last 12. They're just two games out of first place in the National League East. There is a fine line between winning and losing. The confidence a team has that they can win a game versus a feeling that it won't go their way. I asked Art how last night when this recent feeling of good vibes began for the Mets. Tommy started with that one nothing win. To be able to win a, a one nothing game against a, a pitcher of the caliber that we faced that day in Arizona, it, it showed a lot about this club. And, uh, and it kind of it gave us a little shot in the arm that day. And the rest of the pitchers and the hitters, and we just kind of put things together from there. And they kind of believe in themselves now. They definitely believe in themselves that they can go out and win every night we go out there. Everybody's just having a good time. And and that's what this game is all about. That's what playing New York is all about. That's the reason, one of the reasons I came here, is to have the fans the way they are right now, uh, cheering every moment, everything, every pitch, every swing. You know, everybody's just into the game. That, that, that's that's big. That's key. And you know, especially um, with how things were last year, it was kind of tough. Come to the park and try and get your your mind right. Uh, to have it like this is a uh, is unbelievable lately. Tonight's game available with Spanish commentary from Juan Alicea and Billy Barroa. Use the SAP function on your remote or you're set to listen to the Mets and Espanol. And Matt Ginder getting ready to face a lineup that's shaken up a little bit by Larry Boa tonight. He'll have Doug Glanville, the veteran, back in Philadelphia leading off. Chase Utley moves up to the two spot. Then that middle still Abreu, Tommy Burrell, David Bell leaps up to six. Lieberthal seven and Jimmy Rollins drop to the eight spot tonight. And Matt Ginter on the mound for the match. You see his Rico numbers. Of course, he was called up to take on those Houston Astros when Al Leiter was scratched and subsequently put on a DL. So it's Matt Ginter facing Doug Glanville to lead it off here in the second game of this two-game series. And the first one comes in for a strike. Doug Glanville, longtime Phil, who got moved around a little bit last year. Grew up as a big Philly fan. Remember Texas? Didn't he? He beat the Mets with a home run last year at Wrigley Field, if I remember, right near the end of the year. Went to Texas, went to Wrigley Field in Chicago to play at those Cubbies. He did hit a home run off the Mets. Uh, while playing for the Cubs last year when the Mets went there in the September series and now back in Philadelphia. Marvin Bird gets a night off. Chase Upley bats second. This is Larry Larry Ball I think wanting to. Popped up shallow center Garcia back Cameron in and it's falls and Glanville's on so. It looked like Cameron called off Garcia. Yeah. He did. Danny and Garcia. They did catch him. And he called for it. And at the last moment, you got to give way to the center fielder, especially Mike Cameron. And Mike Cameron misjudged his ability to catch up with that ball that was in front of him. So usually you hear that somebody misjudged a fly ball when it's hit over their head. Right there, Mike might have misjudged the ball that dropped in front of him. Danny Garcia was calling for that ball, and at the last moment, got out of Cameron's way. There's certainly been a few more balls like that than we expected to see with Mike Cameron. I agree. Multiple gold glover in center field. Base hit is the scoring. Batter is Utley, and it's a ball. We're talking about the switch in the Philly lineup after losing to the Mets last night. You have to wonder if Larry Boa said, you know what, I'm going to try and motivate my center fielder and my shortstop. Dropping Jimmy Rollins down in the lineup tonight. You heard Matty reference the fact that our good friends at Elias Sports Bureau researched the Phillies had scored three or more runs in 25 straight games. And, you know, it's one of those things where you say, well, okay, big deal. Then you realize it hadn't been done since eight by Philly team since 1895. <laughs> and you say, okay, well, that is a big deal. And that streak ended last night by Traxel and company. 
now 3-0 to Utley. Of course, a guy like Ginter that is a, a fastball slider guy, he's not going to throw it by people. A defensive misplay behind him has just occurred is painful. And if he walks this guy, that's really going to set the stage for a bad inning with the big boys coming up. He's going to lay this pitch in. See that target? The 3-0 target. And every pitch, a pitcher throws 3-0, they lay the ball in there. Most of the time, the hitter is taking. That's why most of the time, the hitter should be swinging. He's gonna, that's the best pitch. The pitcher is going to let a hitter see his 3-0 pitch. This will be the second best pitch, 3-1. and one. And if you so. told the pitcher, if you said, look, at everybody in that team over there is swinging a bat 3-0, and oh, you put more pressure on the pitcher to throw a strike. Saw the uh, Angels had a three home runs in a row the other night, and Jose Guillen hit his on a 3-0 pitch. I thought of you. Thank you very much. Great pitch. I wish I could have hit it. <laughs> Utley hits it. Jason Phillip, or excuse me, Piazza goes to second base and gets the out. I'll tell you, now that's a nice play for Piazza because it is a tough one for a first baseman. They were out here early today. I mean, the pitchers were covering first base. And he double pumped trying to get the ball out of the glove, but he's still able to get the lead runner. That's the key. Even if he does, does a double pump, I don't think they turn a double play there because Utley batting from the left side of the plate can run. So Piazza making the throw, getting a force at second base. But they were out here, the Mets hit were out here early today. McAlante and the rest of the coaching staff working with the Mets defensively. So Abreu the batter, Utley the runner, Phillips the catcher. We get that straight. It's a ball to a break. And yeah, we'll take a look at that defense behind Ginter. You got Piazza, Danny Garcia, Matsui, and Wigginton in the infield. Floyd, Cameron, and Karim Garcia in the outfield. And as Ted said, Phillips is behind the play. 33rd start right this season for Karim Garcia, who along with Shane Spencer has been a, I don't know if they're a surprise, but they certainly have been pleasant as you look at what Ted was talking about last night against the big three. Steve Traxel shut him down. Well, that was it was brilliant pitching most of it by Traxel but the, uh, the the last pass through that order was by Stanton. Through the middle and that is stopped by Garcia can't record the out he tried the glove flip to Matsui couldn't do it from that position. So it's an infield hit for Abreu. If he could have just raised his body a little bit and flipped it with his hand, but see, he tries to glove flip that ball from the prone position, it's impossible. You have no flexibility in that glove arm. Nice no, try, though, right. by Garcia. Long way. That would have been a long yeah. way for a, a flipped ball to travel. The longest flip we've seen in the last 35 years was the other well, day. Well, that's right. Scott, Scott Rowland. Yeah, exactly. A flip from the third baseman to the second baseman. Mm -hmm from the third base position. Well, Matt Ginner hasn't had a ball hit hard off him yet, and now he's in trouble. Jim Tomey takes strike one. Take a look at our Hyundai keys to the game. Gintner, you got to get those guys. Three, four, and five. Jump on the first good pitch and get Mike Piazza on again tonight with men on base. Now, that first pitch we are talking about is when the Mets are facing Brett Myers. to Tommy because Brett Myers throws I think he leads the league in first pitch strikes. So Burrow behind Tommy the Mets with the shift although tonight in this situation they have to leave Wigginton close enough to guard third they can't move him all the way over. fouls it away to left one ball two strikes you know it's funny Ted last night we were talking about you know occasionally and I mean on rare occasions maybe Jim Tomey should push a bunt to get an, he'd get the first base easily case like this you want him swinging the bat you want him to pull the ball even though 28 of his hits are to right field this year and he's a dead pull hitter this is Jim Tomey's shirt a lot of shirts of Mets and Philly shirts here at Shea Stadium tonight. Trying to see if he can finish off Tommy. Two and two. Of course, that's hard. Tommy has uh, 
that rare quality he has a lot of at bats that end without the ball being put in play. He'll can add his walks and strikeouts most years together and it'll come close to 300. That's a lot of turns to play without hitting the ball. He doesn't cheat himself. Watch this swing if the ball's over the plate. Takes high. That's why he walks so often. Discipline to lay off pitches even when behind. So now it's 3 2. I believe Jim Tome has a street named after him in his hometown. It's pretty good while you're still playing. Runners don't go, and Tome takes high. Get it from a change on 3 2. And. Uh, See that pitch up high? You know, I'll tell you right now. It didn't look like it was that high. Whatever happened to the high strike? Tome had committed himself looking for that fastball, and Gintner had taken something off the pitch. But now, you mentioned that Hyundai keys to the game, three, four, and five hitters, and you're facing Pat Burrow with the bases loaded. Now, last night, Steve Traxel did to Pat Burrow what no pitcher has ever done. He struck him out three times. Double play ball on the first pitch. Man, you talk about a Walenda walk. Ginner got let down by his defense, ends up with the bases loaded, and gets to the other side of that high wire on the double play ball from Burrow. Boy, how fortunate does Matt Ginner feel to get this? Bases loaded, first pitch. From Pat Burrow. Our Panasonic digital replay is 6 4 3 double play. And to get Pat Burrow to do that with the bases loaded the way he hits the Mets, tip your hat to Matt Gintner, who didn't allow mm. the problem in the first inning to affect him. So the Mets have the same starting lineup as last night, except for Kareem Garcia instead of Shane Spencer in right field. And Piazza last night is 38th career homer against the Phillies. <laughs> Matsui hits the first pitch right back to Brett Myers. One away. Okay, now that, this is interesting because I know a lot of people feel that that first pitch. And Ted, you're somewhat of a proponent of working the counters. We look at the defense: Tomei, Utley, Rollins, and Bell in the infield. Burrow, Glanville, Abreu in the outfield. Lieberthal behind the plate. And Myers on the mound. And Glanville can go get him with the best of them out there in center field. His seventh start in center field this season for the Phillies. But we're talking about. The right hander on the mound, Brett Myers, and he throws the ball over the plate first pitch more than anybody in the National League. With that in mind, I jump on that first pitch as you look at his Rico numbers. There's the low walk count. Phillies have the fewest walks as a staff in the National League. And this is the opposite night for the Mets of last night, where they faced a guy last night that threw a lot of pitches and walked a fair number of hitters. Myers doesn't. And it's not just the first pitches. 68% of the pitches he throws, period, so far this year have been strikes. Fourth highest in the majors. Garcia, base hit right center for Danny Garcia. Well, you can tell a different energy here at Shea Stadium in the clubhouse on the field as you look at Garcia. Poke that ball to right field, and he picks up a base hit. So Garcia's on first base, and Cliff Floyd has been swinging a hot bat lately. Is the hitter. You know, I, I talked to Cliff Floyd. He was telling me the one thing he doesn't like, ratio of strikeouts to walks so he far. He doesn't like that. Well, he doesn't like his ratio. His, his, okay. yeah. Let's see if he gets a pitch first pitch to hit. See how hittable it is. It's in there. Cliff's ratio so far five walks, 20 strikeouts. Piazza behind him. Well, Cliff said something else to me tonight, which I didn't like to hear. He said he didn't know his record against Real Cormier. Talked about that. You're a man's man. You he, came up here and you screwed. Good curveball. Two strikes now to Floyd. Well, Cliff said he he was he said I, I thought for sure I had to hit against him somewhere along the line. And so I owe you dinner. I like it. Now we're talking. Now, now you got to find a place. Well, here in Queens, the best in the country, Parkside. Outside, I'll give you another one. 
I got to get you when we're driving. Inside on a fastball, one, two. They're up in Connecticut. We'll go to Molino's up there in Fairfield. So I'll take you wherever you want to go. Fair. I like good fair. I've been to Fairfield a while. Okay, we're driving up there a couple of days. But how about Cliff Floyd? I didn't think that Cliff Floyd knew his situation gets real, real Cormier. Ball foul. You know, it's funny, another thing talking to Cliff Floyd, he said, you know, when he's at the plate, he knows who's hitting behind him. So he said, they're concerned with Mike Piazza behind him. Then he said he had, to, he had to pinch himself and say, you know what? I'm a good hitter. So I'm going to take advantage of this situation because they, this guy's one of the best hitters in the game. Hey, by the way, uh, Johnny Bench today uh, changed the schedule. He's going to be able to be here when they honor Mike Piazza. So will Lance Parrish. It's going to be a big night on June 18th here at Shea Stadium. Myers a little kick at the dirt there. He's hoping he might get a call here from Ed Montague to Seamer on the inside. Well, it's, that's what you like from Ed Montague, one of the best umpires going. He did not call a similar pitch when Tommy was batting in the top of the yeah. first. He didn't call it here in the bottom of the first. Well, Cliff Floyd with that big blow last night gave the Mets breathing room late in the ball game. Again, I, I commend you, Ted, because you went down and you said, did you or did you not? Now you could have came back upstairs and misled the public. <laughs> More importantly, misled me and you. Well, Myers looked at second, but with Garcia running, the Mets stay out of the double play. Okay, early in the game, do you pitch to him? If it's the ninth inning, you don't pitch to him. If it's the seventh inning, you don't pitch to him. We're going to take a look at last night. His 10th home run this season. He pops that ball over that cable vision sign. That's a Mohegan Sun moment. So Mike Piazza with 10 home runs and plenty of time left this season. Now keep in mind, if he hits one tonight, he ties our colleague Ralph Kiner. One behind Ralph, two behind the, the late Gil Hodges. Gil Hodges, by the way, hit his, hit the home run that would put him ahead of Ralph Kiner when he was a Met, and Ralph was calling the game on radio. According to Bill Simon, so we see here at the ballpark every day. Late great Gil Hodges. Good fastball in there. One ball, one strike. So some terrific names right ahead of Piazza. Before long, he'll pass the two we mentioned in Rocky Calavito. Don't knock the rock. He was a great one, too. He played for Ralph Kiner when Ralph was a general manager in San Diego. Fastball challenge, and it's hit a couple of hops to short. Jimmy Rollins throws out Piazza, and the Mets are done in the first inning. So one completed Shea on this Wednesday night. No score. Mets trying to win their fifth in a row. Matt Ginner will face David Bell, then Mike Lieberthal and Jimmy Rollins. Mets are trying to get two games over 500. The last time they were anywhere over 500 was early August of 02. And there was one fateful day against the Diamondbacks here that the Mets never really recovered from, which we'll get into in a moment. First, a fly ball to right. Kareem Garcia with the catch. Well, another big day here at Shea Stadium. Ted. Celebrating the seventh year of baseball is for kids. They had a press conference here. Fred Wilpon, one of the speakers here, along with David Nolan from Chase. And the big guy, Rusty Stop. A lot of the players on hand. It's a great program the Mets have for kids. Of course, when you have kids, you got Mr. Met there. They were going to have a clinic on the field, but because of the rain, they couldn't have a clinic. But some of the players walked around with a lot of the kids, and it's Again, a J.P. Morgan Chase baseball is for kids, and it was their press conference here at Shea Stadium today. Seventh year yeah. the Mets are involved. And distributed. Chase has distributed over a million tickets to youngsters in the tri-state area in the seven years they've been involved. They've been just great friends of baseball. J.P. Morgan Chase. And they, they have been affiliated with the Mets for many, many years. One of their programs is the retired players that come to Shea Stadium yeah. every year and it's a terrific program. That's exactly right. 
all of the, the great work that's happened here in recent years, bringing back former Mets, has really been fueled by Chase. Yeah. Their, their support of baseball. And the, play, the, the retired players enjoy coming back. Hop foul back. Lieberthal with a 2 2 count. Now we're talking about that fateful day here two years ago when the Mets were in the wild card chase and they had a doubleheader day here against the Diamondbacks. And, and Gardo Alfonso hit a dramatic three run homer at the bottom of the eighth of the first game to put the Mets in front by a run. But Craig Council went off the top of the ninth, hit his first home run of the year off Armando Benitez. It's popped into right by Lieberthal. And caught by Garcia, two down. Benitez then said he couldn't come back out to pitch the 10. The Mets lost the game, lost the second game, and then went on to lose 15 in a row at home. An incredible, I mean, just an unthinkable yeah. streak. And, and really, until the last two weeks, the Mets haven't recovered from that day. Well, the, you know, that's why it's been so nice, Fred. The, the vibe that you feel here at Shea right. the last two weeks. Well, you know, it's funny. You can see in the stands, of course, tonight the attendance will be affected by the potentially bad weather. But in the clubhouse, it's different. When you watch the players on the field, there's a different energy, and it comes with winning. Well, it's something we we've, we talked to hear about it earlier in the year, and it, it doesn't make as much impact, I think, and maybe doesn't make as much sense to people when the team's not winning. But this Met team is a little more spirit yeah. in the last couple of years. Wigginton on the check swing. Frustrating for Rollins. 2 0, you go out and check swing, but a good inning for Kitzer. Graham Garcia will start at the bottom of the second against Brett Myers. Okay, first pitch, let's see. Yep. See, now, I'm sure the Mets have talked about him. They know the numbers. First pitch strike. That's a first pitch ball. This, this whole theory about, about hitting a guy like Myers that's throwing a lot of strikes is interesting because Maddox triggers the same sort of debate. And you generally see hitters go up there against Maddox ready to swing, figuring they don't want to fall behind the game. Here's the we told you about it. Schilling and Johnson, two pretty good guys ahead of him. Now you're doing a pitcher a favor if he throws the ball over the plate, you swing first pitch and you make an out. You're doing yourself a favor if you get a pitch to hit first at the first pitch and you drive it. So I, I think you should go up and, and yeah. take a rip as soon as you see that pitch in your area. Now Myers is certainly not Maddox, not right to compare them. I'm just saying it's the same sort of theory. And the, and people tell me this is what driven well by Garcia, but to Glanville for the out. Anyway, people tell me, the theorize who know Maddox pretty well, that they think Maddox uses that to his benefit, that he'll toy with hitters on the first pitch because he knows they're up there trying to jump on him. And then he ends up getting more often than you would think, hitters to swing at his pitch on the first pitch. Now, Tom, Myers is probably not experienced enough to do that. Tom, well, let's take a look at this and see if this is first pitch over to Jason Phillips. And if he does, if Jason feels good, just tattoo it if you can. He's taking that strike. I mentioned Greg Maddox. I talked to Tom Glavin about him. Tom said, for example, left hander, here's a slider. Bang, he pulls a foul. Here's a second slider. Bang, he pulls the foul. Third pitch, he runs the fastball, starts it inside, pops yeah. it over the plate, he gets him. He said that's his formula. Phillips takes a ball one and one. I know some some hitters like to take the first pitch. Other hitters, like we were talking about, three and all before. The best pitch you're going to see to hit. A lot of guys don't want to do it because they feel right. if they swing and they make an out, it's an insult. You know what? Take your shot. It's a good pitch to hit. Well, that's the, and that is the the essence, I think, of the debate is. Charm. Well, that's a double cassette. Yeah. The catcher and the ump. Mm. But the essence of the debate really is that hitting is about getting a pitch to hit. And for the hitter, it doesn't matter whether it's the first pitch or the hundredth pitch. Yeah, that's right? right. You get a pitch to hit. Ooh, that's a good one. It runs just off the inside. You know, it's funny, I talked to Tommy Lasorda, Ted, and he told me that he believed in swinging at the ball 3-0, but he had a guy like Steve Garvey who was paranoid about swinging the bat 3-0. A lot of good hitters have been. Bounces the curve, 3-2, and my point is that in this era of on-base percentage and pitch counts and trying to get starters out of the game early to bring in the weak part of a bullpen, all those things that have, that have validity, 
that's the one essence of hitting that, that you can't overlook, right? Is that the, 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 the object of the at bat is to get a pitch to hit. Absolutely. And, and Phillips got one to hit. Left field. Burl at the wall. And it is caught. Burl got under it, poised himself, and leaps at the fence to bring it back. What, what Jason Phillips needed right there was a shorter left field. Because this guy's about 6'6". Pat Burrow made it look easy. Burrow goes right to the wall. He's become a much better outfielder also. Look at that. Brings that ball back. He's about 6'6". Six six, six inches. And he used all of it to bring that ball back. That's a home run brought back by Pat Burrow. And he's not going to look at this. You know, he has just come out of a slump. And when that happens, if you're not a happy camper, you go back to the dugout. Even though you feel, you know what, I hit the ball over the fence. It's not the same when it doesn't count. Of course, the other thing there is it was so hot that it gave Burrow plenty of time to go back, to read the wall, to plant, and time himself. Burrow signed as a third baseman. Played his collegiate ball down there at the University of Miami yeah. and was well, one of the best hitters in college. You know what he really signed as? A bat. Yeah, that's right. That's right. I mean, that was his nickname. But you got to give him a bat. glove. <laughs> and right, and they found, and actually, he, you're right, he's turned himself into an acceptable big league left fielder. See the shot of Jason Phillips? Do you want me to interpret what he's thinking? <laughs> yeah. Oh, Go ahead. Between innings. <laughs> Look at Lawhall, he's not happy. Yeah. That's a great shot. There's a lot of blankety blanks in that in that thought process right there. And I, you know it's funny you go back in that dugout you sit there you want to go get him really that's what well, you want to do. Well the funny thing about that is that's one where I agree with you. You can't tell a hitter that, that evens out because it doesn't. No. The bloop that falls in is a single. That's a home run. 3-2 now to Mike Cameron. When you think of Jason Phillips, and you also think of Gagne out there in L.A. who's just dominating coming out of the bullpen. Jason Phillips would have broke the streak. He had a bullet off of Gagne while he was in his slump. So Gagne pitched in good luck, and right there, Jason Phillips hit in bad luck. Cameron fouls one away. Jason has to put the equipment on, and the pitcher expects him to forget about his hitting. If he was playing first base, he could go out and continue to think about that ball. Now back again, and just imagine what that's been like for Phillips, because here's a guy that spent most of last year playing first base, that spent all the spring playing first base, first month of the year playing first base, and now suddenly, hey, by the way, why don't you go back and no, Call the game again for us. And, and I'll guarantee, I mean, he's not going to say it. Nobody in the right mind would say it, but he's thinking, you know, I had a pretty good year at first base. It's not as taxing as catching as Cameron strikes out. I mean, I walks if he goes down first base. But Phillips is sitting there going, now I'm going to go back and I'm going to get behind the plate. He's a good catcher. In fact, last night, his play behind the plate last night, Absolutely. I thought was the key to that game. He cut down a lead runner at third base, kept the runners on second and first. They didn't have to bring the infield in. And they were able to pitch out of a jam. So Cameron to board with the two out walk. And Wigginton gets out of the eighth spot. Now it's a logical place to try and steal. And they, one of the reasons the Mets picked up Mike Cameron, he was going right there. They checked and he, and he saw his first move. Was heading towards second, but he's quick enough to retreat to first base. Now that usually takes away the runner's aggressiveness because they saw him starting to go back to first. We'll see if Cameron is in motion. Now, Met runners have the green light. They run on their own, which is the best way to steal a base. If you're told to steal a base, it's a lot more difficult than when you can pick your own pitch. Base is stolen against Myers this year in seven starts. Three and out of four. Cameron not running. Wigginson fouls it. Just the thinking behind the base stealing attempt here is that if you're thrown out, 
then you have your eighth place hitter lead off the next inning rather than the pitcher. If you're successful, they may walk this guy and clear the pitcher out. Last night we saw them go after Ty Wigginton. Well, now it's two strikes. So. And you know, in the back of your mind, as an eighth hitter, you, you are thinking, well, they're going to make me hit their best pitch. So psychologically, it's defeating but, to an eighth hitter. But I tell you what, now that's one of the few times you'll probably see Ty Wigginton in the eighth spot get two straight fastballs. His first two pitches were fastballs. He had good swings at him. Well, one of the reasons this big right hander has good control is because he throws most of the fastballs. Now Cameron does go, pitches a ball, and the throw not in time. So he came with the curve on 0 2. Cameron steals his ninth base. I'm surprised right there that uh, that was called a ball. As you see, Lieberthal make that throw to second base, and Cameron is in safely. So a stolen base. Look at his jump. One, two, three, four, five. He's got five. Do they appeal? And, and it's okay. They appealed the third finally that he swung. Oh, excuse me, to first base. Yeah. They, okay, they appealed to Paul Schreiber, and Paul Schreiber ruled it was a swinging strike. I, th I thought it looked so, like a strike going over the plate. So well, it wasn't called that way by Eddie Montague. That's what I kept looking. But he raised the steal for Cameron. It's a strikeout. And at the end of two here at Shea, we have no score. Third inning at Shea, no score. Brent Myers taking a strike and now swinging at strike two as we replay this last pitch to Wiggins. Did he go around? The appeal said yes, and you know what? He did. Good idea to appeal. Kevin Minder up here yeah. pointed at that right away. Now the Phil, uh, the, you know, again, the pitch looked pretty good. Eddie Montague, though, ruled it a ball, and the Philly dugout was all jumping up trying to get Lieberthal to make sure they appealed the first. As Cameron loses the stolen base. You know, we, we had that list of guys who get that ball over the plate, similar to Myers. Kurt Schilling's there throughout his career. Kurt Schilling threw 90% fastball. Breaking ball tapped to third. And Wigginton throws out the pitcher. Easiest pitch to control is the fastball. If you see a guy who throws strikes in an unbelievable fashion, it's usually because he's a dominant fastball pitcher. Talk to Tom Glavin about, as you look at Doug Wendell, why he does not throw breaking balls. And he said, you know, I had a, a curveball and a slider, and I didn't get him over as consistently as my fastball. And that's the reason why I throw that fastball. Changes off the fastball as a four-seamer, has a two-seamer. So basically, with all those changes on the, on the grips and the change of speed, you have more than one pitch. One now to Glanville. That's flared right center. And it'll be Kareem Garcia taking it. Well, MSG's telecast of tonight's Mets game is available right now on high definition only on cable. It features widescreen images up to five times sharper than regular TV and Dolby digital sound to find out just how closely we shaved before the game tonight <laughs> when you watch the Mets in high def only on cable and cable vision pioneer in HD TV as far as the sports world is concerned Madison Square Garden has been televising in HD TV for quite a while now strike to chase Utley there's Utley right on the league average on base percentage wax one Scoots past Garcia, so a two out single. Prolongs the inning, gives Bobby Abreu a chance. Well, Utley has shown a quick bat. A short stroke, quick bat, and the ball eats up Danny Garcia as he moves to his right. And the ball popping over his glove, so a base hit for Chase Utley. Now Abreu rolled one up the middle for a hit. In the first inning. And that's foul back. And Ginter was uh, a starter 
in his college days at Mississippi State and started his first two years in the minor leagues in the Chicago White Sox system. But then the White Sox turned him into a reliever. He actually was a closer at their Triple A team last year. So now he's trying to regain that starter's feel, the starter's stamina. And he's getting a Brayu here and a pop up, assuming it's pulled in by Matsui. And the shortstop takes it. So three zeros on the board that keep the Mets scoreless string going. So we go to the bottom of the third. And won the fans over in the home opener. Trailing the Cardinals in the ninth inning, Carter takes Neil Allen deep to win the game and sends Shea into a frenzy. Hey fans, head to Shea on Friday night, June 4th. Don't miss the exciting NL East battle as the Mets take on the Florida Marlins. The first 25,000 adults 13 and over will receive a Mets ice cube tray courtesy of Dunkin' Donuts. Don't miss this cool new item. For your tickets, stop by Shea Stadium or Keyspan Park. Visit a Mets clubhouse shop, log on to Mets.com, or call 718-507-TIXX. So here's Matt Ginner to start the bottom of the third for the Mets. Remember last Friday night against the Rockies, Ginter helped his own cause with an RBI single. You know, Ted, we were talking about that first pitch strike. I caught a, a relief pitcher who pitched many, many years in the major leagues, Don McMahon, who grew up in Brooklyn, hard throwing right hander. There's that strike. And he told me, he was the pitching coach at the Giants at the time, mm -hmm. and I was a young catcher. He said his theory of pitching was wind up, throw the ball the first pitch as hard as you can over the heart of the plate. He said, if I told young pitchers my theory, they'd get me fired. <laughs> He said they want to hear. Right. They want to hear. You know, put it on this corner, on that corner. But it looks to me like when Myers is jumping ahead of the hitters, that's what he's doing. First pitch, hard as he can, right over the heart of the plate. Ginter puts a pretty good swing on that, and it'll be Glanville in right center to make the catch. And tonight's contestant in the Amtrak a sell a home run inning is Rosiano from Astoria, New York. If the Mets hit a home run this inning, Rose wins tickets to an upcoming Mets game. If the home run goes over the Acela sign out there in right field, Rose wins a trip for two with Acela anywhere on the East Coast. Amtrak, your trip starts here. So Matsui will bat with one out, hit back to the mound his first time. And here's Kaz's offensive numbers on base, slightly better than the league average. And takes one ball, one strike. Well, Kaz Matsu, he's starting to look a little bit more comfortable in his whole game now. Waiting for the ball at the plate, getting the head of the bat out there, a little bit more relaxed defensively, working hard with Matt Galanti. The other, the other part of the Matsui that's interesting is to watch the other players react to him. They genuinely like this guy, despite the fact, you know, here's a guy that came in with a lot of hype. And, in fact, uh, today before the game, yet another Kaz Matsui moment as MasterCard has uh, struck a deal to use Kaz Matsui in the Asia Pacific region to promote their brand. So the announcement of that was made here at Shea before the game tonight. But the players genuinely like Kaz, and I think that's, at least to me, that's been something that's very interesting to watch. And uh, Joe McEwing, in conversation last, last road trip, was, was talking to us about, he kept using the word special. He said, this guy's going to be a special play. Diving stop bell. Can he get him? No. Well, that's the play that got made against, the kind of play that got made against Kaz Matsui last night when he was batting right-handed, Fran. Left-handed, almost impossible to make that play. In fact, we mentioned it last night that if he was batting left-handed, he would have beaten it out. And this is an example. He's on his way out of that batter's box as you look at our Panasonic Ooh. digital replay. <laughs> let's, let's look at that digitally again. Is he, he is. actually say? Yeah. Uh, yes, he is. Yeah, okay. we'll give it to him. But look at him come out of that batter's box. He's running as soon as he makes contact. Yeah. Oh, wow. That's, okay, that was got, closer on the replay than I thought. Now we got to make a decision. Which way do you go? Which way do you go? Well, there was absolutely no argument by the, the Phillies. 
See if Kazmat Sui's put in motion. Let's take a look at it again. Is he out? Is he safe? I think he's safe. Let's see if well, it's, is his foot on the base. It's too close to argue. That's the point. Is his foot on the base? The glove is not closed. I'm going to tell you, that's a lot closer than I thought it was watching it in real time. It was a tie. Who do you give the tie to? That's who he runs. And he's in. So the Mets. Who stole uh, last inning only to have it erased. Steal successfully here. Matsui has two and two nights for him. That's what happens when MasterCard talks to you before the ball game and they sign you to a new deal. Matsui aggressively tonight steals second base. And the ball is bounced by Mike Lieberthal. Oh, there's a Larry. Larry lives and dies on every pitch. I love uh, I, I, I be honest, I don't know Larry Bowler very well. I, I don't really know him, but I love the fact that he cares this much about what he's doing. The passion. <laughs> Look at I mean, I, you know. <laughs> and of course, it's a, you know, Bill Webb feels an affinity because Bill Webb loves guys that he have loves, that kind of passion also. He loves to follow him all over that dugout. But, but you keep wondering at what point, I mean, is there some day when that's just going to take a toll on Larry Bowler? You know, I played against Larry Bow in Reading, Pennsylvania in the mid 60s. He was very intense then, and he's still as intense now, and he's managing. But he's shaking his head at every pitch. I mean, you played with another guy who's like that, Pinella. Oh, yes. I mean, uh, same sort of guy. Throughout their careers. There's a strike 3 1 to Garcia. And I mentioned the other night there are certain guys that even your teammates will say, Watch this. When the guy's mad, so everybody just sits there and watches this guy like Lou Pinello or Larry Boa flip out. And I mean, you're biting the inside of your mouth so you won't laugh. You don't want to fight these guys that are on your team. And they don't hurt anybody but themselves. All four. Well, now the Mets have a chance. Infield hit for Matsui. Walk to Garcia. So Cliff Floyd will bat after Joe Kerrigan visits the mound. You know, a lot of uh, Philly fans come down. Uh, they, they come up here to New York to see the Mets and the Phillies. A decent crowd on hand tonight. Of course, prediction of inclement weather. And if you want to be a part of the energy this season at Shea Stadium in luxury of Mets Diamond View seat. There's a lot of the fans here tonight. Each suite here at Shea holds 15 people. It has a great view of the field and offers a variety of terrific food choices. And you can lease a Mets Diamond View suite for part of the season or just for one game. What better place to celebrate your special event than at the New York Mets game? Right there in the Diamond Club suite. For more information, call 718-803-4053. And you can sit there and watch Cliff Floyd and Mike Piazza hit. Just like you'll watch now. So Floyd, who hit back to the mound his first time, gets a chance with two runners on here in the third. That's a uh, good work of material that they've seen Myers. He faced him three times last year. Pitched very well against them in all three. Cliff played in one of those three. Well, here's that pitch. First pitch, bang, fastball, hard at the plate. We talk about how Cliff likes to watch, watch those videos, read those reports, and he knows just like we knew up here, first pitch strike, first pitch fastball, and he missed the pitch. He hits this one high to right field, but he got under it just enough to keep it in the park. Matsui will tag. Garcia goes halfway and comes back. And Cliff Floyd just missed, and it's the second straight inning the Mets have had an almost. Oh, Cliff Floyd missed the first pitch, but our Panasonic digital replay shows you he just missed the second pitch. Abreu goes back. He had his doubts, but it did stay in the park. And luckily for the Mets, I think Garcia staying at first base is a good idea because you don't want runners in second and third with Piazza hitting and two out. Watch Matsui wisely getting back to second base, tagging up, and reaching third base easily. How about first pitch breaking ball? And it's outside to Piazza. Now here's the guy who is famous for taking the first pitch. So. He could have thrown in the fastball and taken his chances there. So now he's behind Piazza, but there is a base. Well, I was going to say, that's assuming he's going to throw him anything. 
to hit and that may not be the case here. The fastball inside there I, I'd be very surprised if he throws a 2 0 fastball and tries to get it over the plate. Runners are on the corners. Took a rip, even though that was running in on his hands. So anxious to hit. Mike said, I read the report, you throw strikes and you threw a good pitch. That was good location. Well, now let's see if the Phillies change their approach. It would have been 3 0. Instead, it's 2 1. Matsui scores, and Mike Piazza's double gives the Mets a 1 0 lead. Well, Hyundai keys to the game tonight, just like last night, get Piazza up there with runners on base, and just like last night, Piazza delivers again. That pitch similar to the one he fouled back 2 0, and he tattoos this ball and crushes it off the wall out there in left field, just missing. A home run, and Ralph Kiner, who's signing books tonight at Yogi Berra's museum, I'm sure is getting the report as we are speaking. He just missed it. Well, I'll tell you, this has been a frustrating couple of innings for the Mets from one standpoint. As Garcia takes a curve for a strike, Phillips, of course, hit one that might have just crept over the fence in the last inning. Burl caught it. Cliff Floyd hits one about two feet short. And then Piazza hits one about two feet from the top of the wall. It's that close to being about a four or five run right. night so far for the Mets. That, oh, Cliff, well, hey, Cliff's still shaking his head about that ball that didn't go out. You think he's still shaking his head? I'll guarantee you that Jason Phillips, who's on deck, is still thinking about his. And now the Mets, what they really want is the big two out hit from Garcia. Cash in here. Yes. The way they've hit the ball this inning, Myers would be happy if he gets off only one run. And it's fouled away. So two strikes now to Kareem Garcia. Lined to center his first time. And so far, the big play in this game for the Mets is Gintner getting Burrell to ground into a double play in the first inning. Cliff Floyd, I'll guarantee you, that dugout still thinking about that ball that just missed. But Gintner got that double play ball in the first. How about that little hack there? That was staying that alive. Was, that was called. That's called an emergency swing. <laughs> That's I hope I don't I want to, yeah I don't want to get called out on strikes. I hope I foul it off. That's usually a sign of a real good at bat when they make a nasty pitch and you can foul it off and stay alive. You then can get a pitch you can drive. Nope. Slow curve gets him there so. Byers unhappy. Mets made themselves be a little frustrated. Yatsa just missed a big home run. Mets though get one to take the lead. On they've got Wigginton way over. The shortstop's position. Brett Myers pacing, talking with his coach Joe Kerrigan. Now, do you think later on in the game runners in for And he hits right into the ship, right to Matsui. And a 6 3 put out. But there's a lot of respect in shifting on a hitter like Tomei. And the only way he's going to beat that shift, he's going to have to hit a frozen rope someplace where somebody's not standing or over the fence. Still think about that cycle because yeah. it was a trick question last night. And you know, I remember Tim Bogar hitting a cycle, hitting for the cycle in Philadelphia Tim at Bogart. the bat. That's a good one. But I think somebody did it since mm -hmm. then. Was it Timo Perez? No. I don't know. That Burl swings and misses. Mentioned that uh, last night Traxel struck out Burl three times. No Met has ever done that. Burl had struck out three times once other one other game against the Mets but two different pitchers. So now think about it. now Burl's a guy that strikes out a lot. Yes he it does. Gives you an idea how yes, well he he's hit against the Mets. Twenty one career home runs for Pat Burl against the Mets. 
He's got great mechanics at the plate. I remember when he was, they were talking about him using AAA and Hal McRae, who was the hitting instructor for the Phillies, told me that he thought Burrow would be the same type hitter as Scott Rowland, who was established in the big leagues. Pulled foul on the off speed, 2 2. The middle of their order is prone to the strikeout as John Bukovic gives the ball away. Happy for high five. <laughs> Look at that. That's great. <laughs> it's great. High five again, but don't touch the baseball. Exactly. She's easy. <laughs> Can I hold the ball? No way. <laughs> Just give me a high five mm -hmm. and sit out. She's not. Oh, she did let go. She trusts him, huh? I'm going to think she might not let go of that until she's 14. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Into the air, center field. Cameron, boy, there's a nice carry on that ball. Nice Cameron about 390 feet away, but it's pulled in. New York Mets baseball brought to you in part by HIP Health Plan. Now that's hip by Land Rover. Visit LandRoverUSA.com to locate a retailer near you. And by the power of you, your advisor, and Dreyfus. To learn more, call your financial advisor. David Bell now with two down. And Bell takes it inside. Ball in, 1-1. One, one. So the Mets getting a nice little start from Ginter so far. But Mike Lieberthal behind. And this will be the 26th consecutive scoreless inning for the Mets. Four of them tonight for Matt Ginter. The Mets take the lead on to the bottom of the fourth. Jason Phillips leads off the bottom of the fourth. Nearly contributed with the bat first time up. Hit one that was just about to barely clear the wall and left. And Pat Burrell left center field right at the 371 marker. In a leaping grab. Well, no doubt there. It's only a single. But that'll make Phillips feel a little better. So a leadoff hit here in the fourth as we go to Matt Lachlan. Ted, I'm up here in the uh, mezzanine with Lieutenant Colonel Bob Golden. Uh, he's with the 1st Battalion, 10th Marines here as part of Fleet Week in uh, New York City. And talk a little bit about what Fleet Week is all about. Well, it's all about showing the uh, the armed forces to the people of New York. And, uh, you know, we're excited to do it. We're coming up. Uh, I'm an artilleryman myself. We've got some air assets on the Iwo Jima that we brought up. And we've got uh, all kinds of static display, uh, light armored vehicles, uh, Amtraks. Uh, we got a howitzer up here, all kinds of machine guns. So the folks want to come down. It's we're on Pier 86 and Pier 88. We got our displays up uh, all week. The reaction is always uh, wonderful when I see well the people here at Shea coming by and greeting you guys. But as you walk through the streets of New York, I guess you get the same reaction. Oh, we do. And I think a lot of it comes back to uh, you know 9/11. I think it's uh, personal for the folks here in, in in the New York metropolitan area. And I. Uh, uh, you know, we're just happy to be here, and, and it, you know, we're proud to be part of the whole the whole uh, operation here in New York. Well, as the saying goes, the few, the proud, the Marines. What makes you proud to be a Marine? You know, the thing that makes me proud to be a Marine is uh, the energy that the Marines have. I, I, I've been almost 20 years now, and the reason I stay in is because of the Marines. The young Marines are just uh, energetic, uh, go-getters, and uh, just very positive people. All right, we can't let you get away without a question about baseball. Enjoying your time here at Shea? Love coming back to Shea Stadium. Grew up over in Edison, New Jersey, and uh, come to a lot of Mets games, Yankee games. It's always good to come to a ball game. Love baseball. Well, we appreciate your time. Enjoy your stay in New York. And uh, for all who are watching and listening, uh, thanks for serving the country. Thank you. Fellas, back to you. And Wigginton lines one to left, but hits it too well. And Burl is there. Phillips retreats. So very quickly, two down after the leadoff single for Phillips. So Ty Wigginton hitting that ball very hard, and as Ted said, too hard. First pitch. I like it, though. First uh, pitch fastball. He's ready to hit. And he hammered it, but right at Pat Burrell. So Matt Ginter fly to center his first time. Well, Matt Ginter, you, when you think about him, you got to look back to that game he pitched against Clemens in Houston. Did a world of good for his confidence. Absolutely. 
Tonight, a big play was in the first inning. A double play he got Pat Burrell to hit into the double play. Matsui will hit if Ginter keeps the inning going. He's a grip and ripper. Look at that. No gloves. And now he's taking ball three. So. How weird is it? The guy that throws nothing but strikes gets a pitcher up there, and it's three and zero. Oh. And this is what Larry's saying. The this same is the thing. this is the toughest time to throw yeah. a strike when you got a pitcher up there. You know, you're supposed to throw a strike. This is the toughest time to throw it. Right there. Well, Brett Myers is on a roll himself, and he pitched a shutout his last start. In Philadelphia against the Dodgers. Giving up just one run in the first three innings tonight, although the Mets have hit some balls pretty well. That's ball four, and now a gift <laughs> that'll give Matsui a chance. I'll tell you what, Larry Boa, he's going to lose his mind over that. You know, this is where we wish we had, what was that uh, show on MTV with the pop ups? Yeah. You know, the pop up catch. Pop-up video, right? Meininger, I see Meininger knows all that stuff. Nice. Nobody more culturally hip than Kevin Meininger. You're kidding me. That's what that. we need. Wouldn't that work great with Larry Boa? Oh. Pop-up. <laughs> Could be a lot of blankety planks and. There's the runners for Matsui. Like I said, though, I I I just love it because you. How could you not love a guy that cares that much? Well, when, when you play for a manager, I mean, you want to play for a manager that's as intense as you are, as long as he controls his intensity. Yeah, I, I understand that that's where the issue comes in. Playing 200 days in a row for that might not be as easy as I find it up here. I right. understand that. A little bit shade to left for Matsui. Myers up, one ball, one strike. Well, Kaz says not hit for a terrific average, but he has been a productive hitter out of the leadoff spot. Here's a guy with 19 runs batted in second on the team. Two balls in the strike, and of course he has the uh, the game-winning hit against the Brewers, game-tying hit, first game of the homestand against the Cardinals. on that ball like he had no intention to swing. I'm surprised. This looks like a count. pretty good ball to hit. It's looking like he was hoping that would be called a ball. Yeah. This guy here throws a lot of strikes except the pitchers. Hit to short on one hop. So Brett Myers able to get Matsui and prevent two out damage. And we'll move to the fifth at Shea in a one nothing game. All right, here's the app like trivia. We're going to answer it. The last Met to hit for the cycle was. John, John Olerud. Olerud. He did that? it after Tim Bogart. Oh, look at, boy, look at that young Fonzie scoring, huh? Look at that young Olerud. John Olerud, he can play. He can still play. He was a favorite here in New York with the Mets. He had a pretty swing. John Olerud, the last Met to hit for the cycle in September of 97. Maybe on the last leg of his career this year in Seattle. He's been off to a very slow start, but some people believe will be his final year. You one notice, one out of Lieberthal. You notice how those guys couldn't wait to show us footage of we were wrong. <laughs> if we were right, it would have been a graphic. They had the footage, all four hits. Well, that's. And Jim Gallagher is a screamer into the seats from Lieberthal, one and two. Great crew with Jim Gallagher, Charlie Cuchera, mm -hmm. producer Good. Mike Santini, Good. and of course all of our great cameramen, technical yep. operators, yep. men and women, all of them yes. carrying Bill Webb through another time. Absolutely. I'm glad, well done. Glad you emphasized that. <laughs> Ooh, that hit. Lieberthal says yes. Yeah. Eddie Montague's not sure. We're gonna get it. We're gonna get a little gripe here. If it, there, there he's getting ready, and here he comes. You want to see? Uh, and he's saying to hit the bat. 
Here comes the bobblehead doll. I'm telling you right now. Watch Larry Bow flip out. Well, this is the right. Eddie Montague, who's a third in seniority amongst major league umpires, has got a great, just got the right attitude, the absolute right demeanor. How about Larry calmly said, check yeah. his hand. Look at that. How and about that? All right, well, that's going to get Art Howe. Now we're going to get the bobblehead right here <laughs> from the other side. Yeah, remember that shoot by well, Of course, game? yeah. Cleon Jones in the 69 series. I understand the shoe polish. Even that can be questionable. Well, the yeah. Hand? Well, the shoe polish, of course, it came from the dugout. Can the you? Ball. How about if you slap your hand before you go to the plate? Well, that looks like that did hit him. Let's take another look. We slowed down. It looks like that ball did hit him. Oh, I don't know. Yeah. It looked well, like that angle. That. Well, you can't tell from that. Let's let's listen to it. it hit him. I think so. That hurt. The first angle with the dead on shot, it did look like it hit. So there's a leadoff runner for the Phils, Jimmy Rollins at the plate. Take a look at it again as Lieber thought doesn't get the hand down quick enough. This is the angle the bat's you know, held at. But how did he hit the, the back of his hand in that in that instance? I could see it hitting the fingers, but not the back of the hand. what we're talking about for those who are not of age in the 69 series here at Shea. One of the turning points. I can't remember whether it's game three or game four, but Cleon Jones was batting. A ball was thrown in the dirt near his shoe. The ball carried into the Met dugout. By the time Gil Hodges brought the, the ball out to the home plate umpire, Lou DeMiro, it had shoe polish on it. Up the middle, Matsui, Garcia, and not in time for one. And the throw which is just a, a tough mistake there goes into the dugout and that puts Rollins at second base and Garcia right to be mad with himself that's not a good not a good play sometimes when you catch a ball you want to be a little bit more prudent right here Garcia through the you know he had time really to step towards the runner and still get out of his way watch this Kazmat so he flips it to Garcia he had some yes. time to step towards first base. He's a little concerned about the guy coming yeah. in on him, and you just can't give a base away like that. With the dugout so close here at Shea Stadium, anything to the left of first baseman is heading toward that dugout. Myers will send Rollins to third. Matsui does the right thing. Make sure you yeah. get the second out. He did the right thing. And of course, Rollins with good speed will dictate that the ball hit to the left of you if you're a runner you go to the next base ball hit to your right you stay at second base right there you could see the ball was hit Rollins was by it and that so he played it to Rollins is left so there's no play at third base he'd have been you know what I'm gonna take that back he would have been taking a chance they probably could have gotten there but there would have been a big chance that's that's a risk reward that's not worth it yeah because he just a second out here now get the hit. It's Glanville who's got a chance to make the Mets pay for the error. There's a attempt by Danny Garcia to make a heroic play that has now given the Phils a chance to get the tying run across. Ball one strike. Chase Utley on deck. Third, Wigginton. And a nice pick up there. Ginter gets two outs after the error. And a Mets pick up, Danny Garcia. Danny Garcia will start the last of the fifth as the Mets try to chip away again at Brett Myers. 23 year old Philly starter. Danny is singled and walked. Well, it's taken us a few nights to figure out why Kevin Meininger is working with us, but we've now discovered he is our researcher. Out the way. And Kevin's helping me refresh my memory that the shoe polish incident we referred to was in game five, which is the final game of the series. The Mets were down 3 0 in the bottom of the sixth. Dave McNally threw that ball in the dirt. Cleon Jones, Gil Hodges comes out with shoe polish on it. Somebody in the dugout. Cleon gets awarded first base. Don Clendenin came up and hit a home run. 
That is a foul ball. Well, then it homered the next batter to make it 3-2 Orioles, and the Mets went on to score the seventh and eighth to win the World Series. And Gil Hodges came out in a very calm manner. There's a shot at Cleon Jones, one of the better hitters in the history of the New York Mets. Great athlete from Mobile, Alabama. Tommy Agee told me that Cleon Jones could have been a professional football player. He was that good. How about that the shot, Tommy ball. Agee? Yeah, the late Tommy Agee remembered that supposedly the longest ball ever hit here. I can't believe he hit it that far. Well, it's the longest one here that ever hit a seat. Of course, there have been some others. I, I can't fathom that there's anything hit more than the one Mo Vaughn hit here two years ago. He squirts that ball up in that Budweiser sign. It was well got everything behind it. That was just that was scary. Mm -hmm. You know, between innings, that a buddy of ours in the production department here at Shea Stadium was saluted on the scoreboard because after eight years, Chris Cronosio is moving on to the film industry. He did a great job here at Shea Stadium. In the production department, with Vito Vitiello and the guys and the girls over there, and I want to wish Chris all the luck in the world in his future in the film industry. Ooh, and that's that's one of the first curveballs up that's been called a strike tonight by Ed Montague. And Garcia's rung up on this. See this hanging breaking ball, and you still, you know, you take it and it's strike three. Well, fans, you can win $100,000 in the Hyundai Win-Win Sweepstakes. Enter at participating Hyundai dealerships between June 1st and June 10th. Then on Thursdays, starting June 17th, Fox Sportsnet chooses a baseball feat, a rare one. If it happens and your name is drawn, you can win hundred grand. And to find a participating Hyundai dealer, just go to msgnetwork.com. Cliff Lloyd, who got under a ball in tonight's ball game and just missed yep. hitting it out to right field. 0 for 2. Well, Mets are heading out. The Phillies are as well right after the game. Mets get on an airplane tonight to go to Florida. They'll enjoy an off day in Florida tomorrow. Their first game of the year with the Marlins Friday. The Phillies going back home. And tomorrow night they'll host the Braves. First time those teams have played this year. Tom Glavin against Dontrell Willis Friday night. Terrific battle. Glavin's How about that in him? one of those stretches where he's getting the, the big boys to bat every time. Huh? But you know what? It's amazing. I mean, he, he's not concerned. I, after sitting with him before that game in Arizona, when he was pitching against the big unit, nothing is going to unnerve Tom Glavin. Cliff Floyd, good rip there on 3 1. This will wake you up if you've had a, a, a tough night and you're a catcher. The one that really nails you is the one that hits the glove and then comes up and blasts the mask. Phillies dugout. Billy Wagner on the yeah. one, did it? Mm -hmm. Billy Wagner, who's closer but is on the disabled list right now. His first year at the Phillies. And Cliff pops this one up into right center. Glanville makes the catch, two down. If the Phillies do get Mets hope it doesn't happen tonight. The Phillies do get into a closing situation tonight. Tim Worrell, veteran, closed for San Francisco last year, is now closing for the Phillies while Wagner's disabled. They had a safety net when Wagner was injured, but this is a great story. Wagner's about five foot ten, throws the ball very hard, left-handed pitcher, can get it up there at 100 miles an hour. Story I heard when he was a youngster, he was right-handed and broke his arm. He started throwing left-handed. Yeah, it's 100 miles an hour. What a story that is. No, after Piazza hits, if we keep this inning going, I'll tell you another Wagner to Philadelphia story. Piazza with the ground out to short, and then he doubled off the left field wall to drive into the game's lone run. Just missing that yeah. home run. About two feet shy of being a home run. This one in the hole and a base hit. Now Mike's swinging a good bat. Yeah, when he does that, when he gets fooled, 
and hits a rope in the left field. He is swinging a good bat. Watch this. That's a nasty pitch, knee high or lower. Here's our Panasonic digital replay, and Piazza goes out there and scalds that ball. Don't forget now, on the 18th of this month, the greatest catchers in the game, Yogi Berra, Johnny Bench, Carlton Fist, they'll all be here to salute Mike Piazza for breaking the record set by Carlton Fisk. Here's Garcia. By the way, there. Gary Carter will also be. Let's not forget the kid. Line to center and struck out is Kareem Garcia. I was going to tell you quickly about Billy Wagner. <laughs> his introduction to Philadelphia comes in to close a game. Throws his first pitch 101 miles an hour. Strike one. Strike one to Garcia. Second pitch, 100 miles an hour. Strike two. Third pitch, 98 miles an hour. Strike three, and the fans booed him. <laughs> it was 98. <laughs> Only in Philly. I said that was his introduction to Philadelphia. <laughs> he wasn't a happy camper when the Astros did not sign him, and then went out and signed Clemens and Pettit. One and two now to Garcia. Their stance in that non-signing of Billy Wagner's were. Couldn't afford him. So look at Jason Phillips on deck. Basically, Houston made up their mind to go with Octavio Dotel, who throws the ball very hard well, also. Yeah, Pettit replaced Wagner. That mm -hmm. the money. That's what they did. Mm -hmm. Struck out again. So Myers fans Garcia for the second time. That is the fifth strikeout overall. And this good pitching battle goes to the sixth. One nothing Mets. Hundred bucks in the Champion Mortgage Protecting Home Plate Sweepstakes. Just send a postcard to this address. If you're selected and the Mets shut out their opponents, you win. Champion Mortgage, your home equity loan and refinancing specialist. As we go to the sixth, time to look at our Jeep game summary. It's all about Mike Piazza swinging that bat. Two, our, two out RBI double in the third. How about Kinter? What a story this is. Came up in Houston to pitch against Roger Clemens and he has stayed. He, he enjoys it up here. Runners in scoring position. Phillies 0 for 3. Mets 1 for 5. We have a 1 nothing ball game as we go to the top of the sixth inning. But a real challenge here for Ginner this night for the Mets in that scoreless streak as Ginner has to go through the heart of the Phillies order a third time. Utley starts, then Abreu and Tony. You know what you're saying. Third time around. A lot of pitchers feel that could be the toughest part. Now, can Wiggins make the play? Good throw. Well, that was the key. Wiggy got up to his feet and fired a strike to Piazza. Nice stop by Ty Wigginton. That had double written all over it because Utley can fly. He gloves the ball. He comes up and fires across the infield. They get Utley by a step. Another look. That ball was by him. He gloved it. Nice play by Ty Wigginton. Boy, that's going to feel good for Wigginton after last night. Yes, the play last night. See, that's the key. Had too much time last night. The ball he dropped, he was throwing it across the infield in the key spot. What really hurt is he couldn't redeem himself last night. As you look at the heart of the Philly order and look at last night and tonight, these guys have been smoking since opening day this year. Well, the only extra base hit was a double by Tommy last night. Abreu with an infield hit tonight. Those are the only hits from these powerful heart of the order so far through 14 plus innings. Two and one now to Abreu. Well, by the way, our buddy Ralph Kiner signing books tonight at Yogi Barra's Museum. Great book, as we both know. We read Ralph's book. It's just terrific book that Ralph put together. Three and one to Abreu. And of course, there's another book for a summer reading, another baseball book. Bill Madden, who's at the ballpark today, has a book out. And it's columns he has written over the last 25 years. I highly respect the baseball writer. Now, there's Ginner. He gets away with a 3 1 pitch there. So, Abreu got that just a little bit to the end of the bat. And he flies out. So, two away here in the sixth. And now, if Ginner can get Tony. I mean, you talk about pitching here with no margin. It's a one run ball. He can get Tony. Walk off the field with six zeros against this ball club. That would be 
be some night for Matt Ginn. Maybe the best he's had in the big leagues. You're not taking him out of the game, are you? Oh, I'm not. No, not yet. But okay. I'd say that's a heck of an achievement. Because you, you'd be Captain Hook in that dugout. <laughs> well, look at the Mets with this. They've got the wishbone in play on the right side. Defense that first was used against Barry Bonds. First time I ever saw a second baseman go that far into the outfield. Teams have emulated it to use against other left hand hitters now. Well, tell me, you know, we talked about last night as you look at Garcia out there in the grass. We talked about last night the possibility of bunting. Right now, you don't want him to do that. You want him to hit a home run. The, he, the Phillies want to tie this ball game up. They signed him for one reason the long ball and RBIs. Not on base percentage, the long ball and RBIs. So now it's 3 0, and that means you flirt with Burrow. Walk Tommy in the first inning. There's a strike. And it's the only walk that Gitter has issued. There's no way that you have Tommy taking a pitch that he could drive three and all. Now he drives that one for a hit. Can they cut it off the gap? Cameron slides. Ball caroms off him. Tommy will stop at second. And now this gives the Mets a Walker. choice. On a two out double, who to pitch to? Here it is again, the ball in right center field. Watch Cameron slide, unable to come, but it cleanly kicks the ball around a little bit. Tom A goes into second base with a double. Well, you got Pat Burrell, who this year is having a solid year. He's comfortable hitting against the Mets. You have a good hitter on deck, more of a contact hitter on deck. You have the option of, of pitching Burrell tough or walking him. Intention. Sixth inning, they're going at him. Strike one on the outside. Well, this is uh, this is an interesting call. It's a tough one given Burrell's history against the Mets. David Bell went right. Very good RBI man. Wow, that's a good pitch. Apparently ran just inside. One one. That is a good that's pitch. A, that is a pitcher's pitch. Pitch. Any part of the play? That's oh. a strike. Yes, it is. Is our camera? Can our camera be wrong? Yeah. Well, now if you're Matt Gitter, you're a little bit flustered here because I mean Ed Montague is actually one of the best umpires going. Now he just missed one on the second pitch. Okay, you're behind two and, and one. Now he now he doesn't get the outside, so it's two and one. Okay, so it's two and one. Good fastball hitter at the plate. If you have confidence in throwing that breaking ball over the plate, or do you walk him? I can't I can't let Burrow beat me here. Now you can do that. You throw that pitch, and, and, if, and if you walk him, so be it. Okay, two and two now because there are two, two more of those. Absolutely, I agree. There's He's a, not going to hit that other park if he wants to walk on it. Looks like a breaking ball. You know what? I go right down the line with that breaking ball because it's a good fastball hitter. If you throw him a good breaking ball, he gets a hit, you tip your cap. Throw it to the corner. He did. Another slider and Ginner strikes out Burl. He gets through the heart of the order a third time. Burl shaking his head in 28 straight scoreless innings for the Mets. Catch the energy of Mets baseball as the Marlins head to Shea for their first meeting of the 2004 season on Thursday, June 3rd. The first 25,000 fans attending the 7:10 p.m. game will receive a 2004 commemorative Mets baseball card pack from Fleer Trading Cards. For tickets, show up at Shea or Keyspan Park. Call 718-507-TIXX or log on to Mets.com. Mets. Well, clutch pitching. We talk about clutch hitting, clutch defense. Now clutch pitching. Enters pitching to Burrow. Look at that pitch right there. He threw him a nasty breaking ball to get him. Well, and that's a huge strikeout. Franny, the key is what we talked about. He threw him two straight. He threw him once he fell behind two and one. With sliders off the plate. That's Ginner, really Ginner's best pitch is a slider. And you're running and him back out there, I hope. Yeah. You, you have a quick hook. <laughs> I've noticed that. <laughs> yes, I'd run him back out there. Jason Phillips will start in the bottom of the sixth. Jason had a single his last time up. First time up, thought he'd hit one out. Burl thought differently. Roman, nice play bringing that ball back in. 
Back through the middle. Well, Phillips got denied a home run. He's trying to make up for it. He's had two singles since. How did he get denied a home run? Well, watch this. We'll take you back and review the second inning blast. A long fly ball left field. Burrow goes back to the wall, jumps up, and brings the ball back in. Boy, the, the real telling tale was after the ball was hit, Brett Myers dropped his head. The pitcher dropped his head. He thought he'd given up a home run. And Jason Phillips thought he had one, but Pat Burrell said no way. So Mike Cameron at the plate. He's walked and struck out. Curveball strike. Well, it's been a struggle as Cameron's batting average has gone on a total free fall since the injury to his right hand here three weeks ago. Now barely above 200. It's difficult. Difficult because Cameron, all right, shouldn't be playing, but he That's won't right. come out, and he's not. I mean, he's talking and laughing before the game and trying to be a part of the team despite struggling so much at the plate. As long he took some batting practice, extra BP today. As long as the team wins, you can accept that right. pain in your hand, and you can take your own for force. But if the team starts to struggle and you're still struggling. Then, you know, they kind of forget you have this well, engine. I was going to say, that's what's going to happen here. It's starting a little bit with Mike as Metallico gets ready, the former Phil. He's hearing a few boos. And uh, people don't really know or care much that you're battling a bad hand. They see you out there in a uniform. That's right. That's exactly and right. That's going to be a, a, a challenge for Mike Cameron. Is that one well to right center? You see, Mike just, I don't think he can get the pop that he was getting early in the year. And if you don't get it, you make it up, they kind of forget that you do have that injury. Take a look at it again now. Ted's talking about driving that head of the bat through the hitting zone, and he doesn't drive it through as violently with the sore hand. But the interesting thing about that swing, Fran, is unlike a week ago, at least Mike is able to keep his top hand on the bat. He couldn't even keep his mm. top hand on the bat last week. Yeah, he, you know, of course, Denny Wally, I'm sure, has talked to an Art Howe. Good thing about what he could probably do right now is try to hit everything up the middle or to the right side, understanding that, you know what? You're not going to really drive the ball at the pellet because you've got a bad hand. And of course, you'll cut down on your strikeouts if you try to hit the ball up the middle and to the right side. Well, Ty Wigginton at the plate. And he pulls one fan. And that's going to get Phillips running. <laughs> it's going to get to third. Jason I didn't mean Phillips. to start on you there. I understand. Two that word out there. And Jason Phillips hustled from first to third on a double off the bat of Ty Wigginton. You don't want to be a, hit, a player that clogs up the base paths. And right here, Jason Phillips said, I don't clog up the base path. You hit it down the left field line, I'll go from first to third on a double. And he did it as Pat Pearl hustled over after that ball. But Jason Phillips. Goes from first to third, not in a real fast. Here's a take a look at uh, Ty Wigginton. Look at that head down. Key that he had great balance, hips open, but the head is on the ball. If you slow down, anybody hits a ball hard, you'll see the head go down as they're making contact with the ball. Meeting breaks up. We remind you that Sunday night here on MSG, it's Metro Stars action. 7 o'clock for Metro Stars game night. Then at 7.30, Metro Stars host the Kansas City Wizards. It's all Sunday night on MSG. Well, Matt Ginner gave Art Howe everything he could have hoped for tonight. Six shutout innings, three trips through the middle. And now the Mets are going for runs. And Valent pinch hits with the infield in. And the former Phillies will get a chance to contribute. Valent first as a pinch hitter. And then Botalico, the former Phillies closer, will come in to work the seventh inning. John Franco is also in the pen. Valent, former first round pick by the Phillies. Trying to make sure he gets one to the outfield. Remember now that it is a little different scenario with Phillips, the runner at third. It'll have to be a fly ball of decent depth. Yeah, there's no breaking in contact here. J 
Jason Phillips. On third base, you saw Ty Wigginton on second base. He has to pick up Jason and find out exactly what Jason's going to be doing. A foul, so Valent. Now 2 1. There's veteran Roberto Hernandez warming up in the Phillies bullpen. Lent batting with the infield and the outfielders, corner outfielders for the Phils are pretty good throwing arms, particularly Abreu and right, although Abreu's playing deep. Breaking ball in, three and one. Yeah, Abreu has the best throwing arm in that outfield right now, yeah. but they all throw the ball pretty well. Burl has had a very high number of assists. I feel like it's challenging. But he's, but he's been, obviously been able to make enough throws to get those assists. Fastball, 3-2. Well, he's not down the line with that fastball. You got Matsui on deck. So Eric Valent, who knows these Phillies, has to look for that heater. Of course, two strikes, you're going to look Jeez. for the heater. Yeah, he got it up. He may get another one up here. Going right up the ladder. No, oh, oh, came back with a that? nasty curveball. Wow. Well, you got to sit on a fastball with two strikes. So if the guy gets to break the ball over, you're in trouble. Take a look at it again. Three and two hook. Out of the strike zone. Well, you know, that's why Brett Myers just pitched a shutout his last game. That's why he was a first round pick, 12th player in the country pick, because he has that kind of stuff. And now they're going to walk Matsui to pitch to Danny Garcia. Got to do that right here. Base open. Matsui with good speed, left hand hitter. You got to go after Danny Garcia. And Garcia's a guy who will battle you. And you see the walk to Kaz Matsui. Four balls out over the plate, or I should say off the plate outside. One thing you never see called is a catcher's buck, but there is such a thing. You're supposed to stay behind a plate until the last moment. And there's our OTB finishing line. You see Ginter's numbers, and he was impressive tonight. And a couple of things that stand out in my mind, and both happened to Burrow. Got him in, into a double play in the first inning with the bases loaded, and then he struck them out in a key spot in the sixth. Good night for Ginter. Yep. Six innings. He had never started a big league game until a couple of weeks ago. It's the longest outing of his career. Now the Mets will stay with Danny Garcia in the hopes of getting Ginner some more runs, cashing in on this two-out chance. Danny Garcia has singled to right center, walked, and been called out on strikes. Hmm. He was called out in the fifth inning on the curve. Danny's been watching from that dugout. He knows this kid throws a lot of heaters as he misses the breaking ball. How about that? Well, that for Danny Garcia. What do you sit on in 2 0? If, if he doesn't throw you a fastball, I'd be amazed. Joe Carrigan looking out. What did Tom Gravin tell me? Well, I couldn't get my breaking ball over as much as my fastball. That's why I throw my fastball all the time. Well, now Garcia can lay the bat down. Three and zero. Oh. oh, he lays the bat down. All right. If he swings, you find him five million dollars. Uh, you're a tough man. Exactly. I give him the hit sign. <laughs> Watch this pitch. <laughs> You'll be managing it. You'll be managing in South Africa. <laughs> Ball four. How about that? The pitcher, who's been a strike machine, walks Danny Garcia. The force in run number two. Here comes Larry, and he's not happy. And yes. Now, now if I give him the inside 3 0 oh, and he takes it's outside ball four, fine. If he gets a pitch belt high, well, he's taking all the way right there. And you know what? That wasn't a bad pitch. Well, it's going to end the night for Brett Myers. Cliff Floyd will be batting for the Mets with the bases loaded, a 2 0 lead as Roberto Hernandez answers the direct connect call to the bullpen. Matt Ginner on the left has finished six shutout innings. Brett Myers on the right, frustrated, having walked in a run.
now turning the ball over to the veteran longtime closer Roberto Hernandez. See Hernandez's numbers now. He's out freshly out of bullpen. He's loose. He's gonna. He's got to throw a strike. I know Ted. A lot of people like to say work the count. If I'm Cliff Floyd, first pitch, I'm wailing. What do you think? I'm very aggressive I know tonight. Very aggressive. I, I said. <laughs> well, Cliff Floyd. I have a feeling he's going to be more in your mindset here too. I think he's going to be ready to hack. And again, a guy like Hernandez, there's no secrets here. Although Cliff's only had three at bats against him. Lifetime, one hit. But remember the 0 for 11 last night. Cliff couldn't. <laughs> Luckily for Cliff, he might have been dead again. Roberto Hernandez. 39 years old now is Hernandez. Pitched in Atlanta last year as a setup man. He's had 320 saves in his career. Well, he just missed right there. So Cliff's got to be ready because he knows he's got to throw him a strike. And he hits the outside. You see that Hernandez at 39 still for those few pitches gets it up there. He's 94 miles an hour. Pretty good pitch right there. 94 miles an hour on the black. And remember, Cliff said in Houston, of course, he's, he's in tune now, but in Houston, he couldn't catch up with a 97 mile per hour fastball from Roy Oswald. Turn up the dive. Nice block, Lieberthal, 2 1. Off speed pitch. This is a huge at bat. Huge situation for well, Hernandez and for Floyd. And, and what, where the Mets have a, Look at a chance to. There's a nice block. Boy, you talk about throwing. Everything in front, but where the Mets get a break here. Now you've, you've got speed out at second base, yeah. and Matt. So we had a decent speed at first with Garcia. He just threw a 95 mile an hour fastball in the corner, and he threw an off speed pitch. A clutch situation right here for both. Fastball misses 3 1. So now Cliff is in a great spot. He could just sit in a zone. You know, Cliff is saying, I gotta turn up the dial. This well, guy's throwing bullets. But Cliff looks for a pitch in one zone here, right? Well, he, obviously he's going to have to look his happy yeah. spot. He wants from his happy spot, right? If it's there, take your rip. If I got a feeling if it's over the plate, it's all his happy spot. For Ball his... four. He's throwing some cheese. Well, he hadn't thrown a strike, though. Mm -mm. Two straight runs walked in by the Phils. It's 3 nothing Mets. You know, Joe Kerrigan is going to say you threw a 95-mile-an-hour fastball, got the count to 1-1, one one, you threw him an off-speed breaking ball in the dirt. Now it's power against power. And uh, you think Piazza's ready for the cheese? Oh, he's ready. He's got it. He's got to turn up that dial. They're all loaded up for Mike Piazza. Speed pitch starts. Fourteen career grand slams for Piazza. His last one was at Philadelphia. Mm. And two straight off speed pitches. So he throws him a slider right yeah, there. I guess he'd call that a hard one. Hard slider. High 80s. There's the career numbers, but now Piazza sits in an 0-2 hole. Piazza tonight, a ground out, an RBI double, and a single. Side there, one and two it stays. Outfield. Hey, Mike actually to go the other way, playing deep, but Landville shading the outside to right center. Ray, you playing really a slightly shading the outside to the right field corner. Got him. So Hernandez. After walking Floyd to 
bring in a run strikes out Piazza but the Mets get two and take a three nothing lead to the seventh. This copyrighted telecast presented by the authority of Sterling Mets may not be reproduced or retransmitted in any form. The accounts and descriptions may not be disseminated without the express written consent of Sterling Mets. Every weeknight, don't miss the WB11 News at 10 for the stories that matter to you and the issues that affect your life. Join Jim Watkins and Heidi Tong weeknights for the WB11 News at 10, although I believe tonight's the night they're flipping and the morning. Crew is working the uh, news at 10 tonight on WB11. Ricky Patalico comes in, and this is going to be a little strange uh, for the longtime Phillies. Patalico, two different stints in a Phillies uniform, a closer for them, successful. All star, in fact, in 1996. He has pitched against the Phillies before. Faces David Bell here to start the seventh. Batalico in 1999 spent one year in St. Louis and he faced the Phillies five times that year. Her ball for a strike and it's quickly 0-2 to Bell. Well, the Phillies know what they're going to get from Ricky Batalico. He's aggressive. He's going to go right after him with that fastball and slider. Told me last year he wasn't ready to pitch in the big leagues after his surgery. He wasn't ready, most importantly, mentally, coming off that surgery. It's sharply and it's off Matsui's glove. And so David Bell reaches base. Take a look at the, that ball again. That's just one of those things, you know, if, if you make the play, it's a terrific play. You're letting that glove do the work, and if the ball bounces off your glove, it's a base hit. Ball's hit hard, and a tough hop for Matsui as Ryan Matson warms up in the bullpen, and then scored a base hit. So Lieberthal, the batter, and fastball strike. So Bell reaching base on an 0-2 pitch, which is frustrating to all on the Mets side. It's now uh, been actually that? officially scored an error. There's strike two, so it is an error. I think that's a tough error. It is the tenth error committed by Matsui this year. Who's that, Bill Shannon over there? Must have had a bad day. Inside one and two. I, I, you know, that's not one I... I have a hard time with that play. So you're going to give him an error? I, I, I could see that. I'm not. I, that's one of those ones I've see both arguments. Hold. Fair. Well, this is going to be very frustrating for the Mets. Bell is going to be waved around. And Matsui will not throw it. So the Phillies break the Mets' scoreless streak with a run. They've got back-to-back two-strike hits here. Lieberthal doubles in. It's 3-1. to one. Well, Lieberthal smoked that ball down the left field line. Watch this. Had a good portion of the plate, and the Lieberthal was just hoping that baby would stay fair, and it did. And it rattled around in the corner. Cliff Floyd hitting Matsui. I'm surprised Matsui didn't throw well, the plate. That's an interesting play Again. by Jim. I'll tell you, that was John Vukovic, the third base coach, made an interesting call there to bring him down three runs to bring Bell in. But but again, I think the AI, I'm assuming it must be the language problem because I thought Matt Sweet, yeah. if he released the ball, had to play at the plate. It, now Jimmy Rollins, the batter. And he drives one over Cameron's head, way back into right center, but Cameron gets back on it. And a good job by Lieberthal. He'll go to third. So Rollins with a long fly ball out. Now the Phillies are a fly ball away from getting back within a run. Watch Mike Cameron chase this ball down and make the grab. And the key here is Lieberthal moving to third base on the out. Very important to get over there. You can score in a wild pitch from pass ball, sacrifice fly, error. 90 feet from home play, dude. So Lieberthal with heads up base running, moving from second to third. So the Mets scoreless streak stopped and as you see how long it had been.
14 years since the Mets have had a scoreless streak of that length. The Mets have not had three consecutive nine inning shutout games since 1985. And that also by the boards. 2 0 now to Jason Michaels, who is batting for Hernandez, Gladville on deck. And the Mets are playing the infield back, obviously, in this situation. They want the out, but the Phillies can get those two runs right back. Michaels puts one in play. 3 0. John Franco ready, and that turn may come around in the eighth. Next time the lineup goes to Tommy and Abreu. That's, well, that's ball four, and that's not what anybody on the Mets side was interested. John Franco's ready. And Arn Howe knows it, and Rick Peterson's going to call just to get it verified. I think Arn Howe's going to go out and make a move. Get Doug Glanville, a right hander up. John Franco turns well, that ball over. Yep. How about this? John Glanville. Franco being his ball game. Glanville, and then you've got lefties, and it is going to be Franco because you've got the lefties behind him, Utley and Abreu. And Tony. So disappointing there for Ricky Metallico. He, the first two hitters in the inning, he got ahead of 0-2 and, and didn't get either one out. That set a bad tone. The Phillies have the tying runs on base. And you can see that's not what Ricky Metallico hoped for, pitching against his old team. As John Franco will answer the next tell, direct connect call to the bullpen. We're right back here on MSG next Tuesday night. This time the site is the brand new ballpark in Philadelphia. The Mets get their first look at it. You'll see it here on MSG. Geico Mets on deck at 6.30 in the game at 7 next Tuesday on MSG. The Mets will actually play Monday afternoon in Philadelphia, then Tuesday and Wednesday nights. So John Franco finds himself in a situation, pressure situation, something he had became accustomed to for many, many years as a closer. You see his numbers brought to you by Rico. Well, this is the, the test for Franco as the Phillies have Lieberthal at third. Michaels is at first. Michaels represents the tying run. Doug Bland build a batter. John Franco pitched an inning last night. And, you know, obviously at John's age, this is the challenge that being in the bullpen represents getting this call in the back-to-back -back days. You can see John Franco in the bullpen. We, we had the camera on him where he has completed his warm-up tosses. There's his bread and butter pitch right there. And that's one thing John Franco knows, how to get that's loose, exactly and that's right. important in the bullpen. Right. You can overthrow there. The other thing that this does, the left-hander also is likely to neutralize any thought that Jason Michaels might have trying to steal his way into scoring position. He is the tying run. Glanville, a little flare, center field, base hit. And the Phillies are within one, and now they've got the tying run at second. Right off the end of the bat. He made his pitch, Glanville made contact, and picked himself up a base hit. Look at that. Took that ball off his ankles. Hit it right off the end of the bat. And of course, it's going to drop in. Didn't have much on it. And Mike Cameron was playing him in a respectable center field position. So couldn't make the play there. Look at this. Reaching that far. Look where the ball is. It's out of the strike zone. And it hits right off the end of the bat. So now it's Franco to Utley. And a strike. did face Utley last night. Got him out on a line drive. It's the third time already. So Utley's got a little experience with Franco. Ball 1-1. One, one. Abreu next. So after being held down for 15 innings, the Phillies a couple of hard hit balls to start the inning broken through and now they're a hit away from tying this a big hit from taking the lead one and two
was that last pitch and it's foul tipped off of Jason Phillips. Phillips was talking last night about how all the offseason work he did to strengthen his legs is coming back to pay a benefit now because the switch back to catching so far he feels fine has not affected him at mm -hmm. all. Usually will happen as the season rolls along. So one and two to Utley. It's ball away two and two. Jason Michaels at second Doug Glanville at first Glanville the lead run. Very good speed. <laughs> Just got a piece of it. Well, Chase Utley last week hit three home runs for these Phillies, and he's got a good stroke. They consider him like a utility player, but he's getting an opportunity to play second base. Mets bullpen still going. Weathers and Stanton, which now makes it an official Met game. Stanton warming up. Utley has hit one home run this year against a lefty in 11 at bats, two hits overall. Old foul, so he's been fighting off some pitches. Playing because Placido Polanco, the regular Phillies second baseman, is on the disabled list. And at least bad. A little bit like Danny Garcia did when Garcia first took hold of the second base job for the Mets about a month ago. The bat has carried him so far. That'll make it easier for the pitcher to see the signals. Yeah, Lieberthal. Mm. Bounced foul again. I'm sure, he's, I'm sure he's not doing that because he's going out after the game. Very important. Well, actually, you know, you see that if you watch for it, you'll see it more than you think. On the field. On the field. I'm okay. Saying. Yes. Where the catcher does that. <laughs> What'd you think I was going? What you meant after the game? <laughs> Although since LASIK, there have been more guys, you know, more pitchers, more players, and anyway, had the LASIK surgery. Because a lot of guys, pitchers have told me they had it done because they were having trouble seeing the signs at night. Let me tell you something, as a catcher, you'll pay for it. <laughs> Up high, well, this battle goes on, and now Utley has worked it full. He's fouled off three tough ones from Franco, come with a fastball. Are you waiting? And John Franco did not want to pitch to him with the bases loaded. Three-two. Let's try to see if the runners might be moving. spot the Mets pay the price for this position change on the fly at Piazza absolutely the ball thrown over Matsui's head and the door is open now for the Phillies they have tied this ball game up and it looked like it could have been a 3-6-1 double play 
Instead, it's an error on Mike Piazza, and the ball game is all tied at three. So two met errors in the inning. The game is tied, and uh, Art Howe's going to the pen for another lefty. He's going lefty for lefty here. Franco out, and Mike Stanton answers the direct connect call to the bullpen. Coming up right after our game on the sports desk tonight, we'll hear from the St. Lucie Mets manager, Tim Tuffle. An update there, Joe Micheletti will talk about the Stanley Cup Finals. Liberty hosting Detroit, coached by Bill Lambier. All that on sports desk, presented by Toyota, right after our game tonight on MSG. Now Mike Stanton continues his Busy, busy workload. Meanwhile, Mike Piazza, no, he can't get out of his mind. It's a combination. It's that strikeout to end the bottom of the six with the bases loaded, and then this throwing error that has set the Phillies up. The game tied, and the lead run at third with Bobby Abreu batting. Breaking ball outside. Joe McEwing comes in in the double switch. McEwing will bat ninth. And the pitcher now bats second. Yeah, Mets right now have to bounce back psychologically in this ball game. It's a brand new game for the Phillies, but it's also a new game for the Mets. Johnson. Burton again being placed on Stanton, and, and you do have reason to wonder how long Stanton can, can handle this. I mean, this is the 26th game in which Stanton has pitched the 46th of the year for the Mets. The ball to Abreu. Abreu, lifetime, just one for seven against Stanton, but he's hoping he could do for his team what Cliff Floyd did for the Mets last night in a similar spot. Floyd did a huge two run double off a lefty reliever. That's a ball, and Stan didn't think so. Three and one. So three balls and one strike. To Abreu. And that's ball four. So now they're loaded up for Tobin. So this is an inning that's had two errors, two walks, a bloop, and one resounding hit, which was Lieberthal's double. And it's an inning that hurt the Mets. It's the kind, this is the kind of inning that hurt the Mets a lot early in the year. Not in the month of May, but the first couple of weeks, these innings that they couldn't stop. Well, they're going to have to stop it right now, and it, they got the work cut out for them. This guy is a bona fide RBI man. He can hit the home run. He's got a double in this ball game, and he's walked. He's also grounded out. The bases are loaded with Phillies, and Mike Stanton has to pitch to Jim Tomei and hope for a ground ball double play. Well, these two guys know each other very well. Long time American League rivals. 23 career at bats. Again, this is short relief, so a lot of different games where Stanton has faced Tommy. Pulled, and it is fair. And that may clear the bases. So Tommy delivers the big hit. Two will score. Abreu stops at third. And the Phillies have the lead. Well, the Phillies had their money man at the plate, one of a couple of money men at the plate, and Jim Tome. And Tome comes through, taking a pitch on the inside part of the plate, hitting the ball hard down the right field line. And two runs score. So here in the seventh inning, you get five runs crossing the plate for the Phillies. And look at back foot hitter. They would they would define Jim Tome as a back foot hitter. And he smoked that ball down that right field line. But Earl will now be.
Cody intentionally walked. We're about to say that in 23 career at bats, Jim Tomey had never homered off Mike Stanton. But still Tomey hasn't. has enough, still has him, but enough hits. That was his seventh hit. And of course, that a damaging two run double. So Burrell draws the intentional walk, and now uh, would expect the Mets to go get Weathers to face the right hander David Bell. And here comes Art Howe to make that move. But this inning, the Mets' defensive. Uh, Gamble of moving Mike Piazza to first base, a position he's not really worked very much at. Position learning on the fly, and it's a, it's it's a gamble the Mets know well what the risk is. They knew exactly there are going to be times where it's going to bite him, and it has happened here in the seventh inning tonight, a throwing error. So David Weathers now will come in to try to finally put an end to this inning. Fourth pitcher of the inning for the Mets is David Weathers. Back uh, with a little less of a workload since uh, missing a week. Arm feels fine, and Weathers now will try to get the Mets off the field. A five-run Philadelphia inning, and the Phillies still have the bases loaded. One man out, and the man who started the inning coming to the plate in David Bell. Yeah. Bell hit it. A sharp one hopper on an 0 2 pitch to start this inning. He hit the ball sharply, but it did hit Kaz Matsui right in the glove. And yes. Matsui was not able to hang on. It was scored in error. It was a hard hit ball, no question. Mm -hmm. It did, uh, but Matsui it, did get it in the glove. He just could not hang yeah, on. It was ruled an error. So Kaz Matsui picks up an error in this ball game. And the Mets in this game have committed three errors. Mike Piazza throwing the ball away into left field on a what looked like would be a double play. Center field, Cameron there. Tag upcoming, and here's Cameron's throw through. And it's going to be a little offline, allowing Abreu to score the sixth run of the inning. So David Bell knew he had to get that ball into the outfield to drive in the run. He did hit the ball deep enough to center field. And the run scores as Bobby Abreu, who has good speed, beats the throw home. Jim Tomei held on at second base. So the Phillies with a 6-3 to three lead here in the seventh and all six runs coming in the seventh inning. Lieberthal fouls it away. He doubled a drive and a run earlier in the inning after Bell reached on the error. Phillies have only three hits in the inning. They've scored six runs. Now well, what the Mets are going to have to try to do when they get back off this field is regroup and realize they still have three turns at bat. that Tomey delivered here in this inning was the hit the Mets have not gotten tonight. They've had three runs scored. But of course, two in the sixth inning were on bases loaded walks. The Mets have left ten runners on through six innings. Tomey's double broke the three all tie. Lieberthal right now just trying to make contact against David Weathers. Rollins on deck. Lieberthal was on his way to putting together a pretty solid career once he got his feet wet in the big leagues, and then he got injured. Freak accident on the base pass set his career back. Kareem Garcia there in right field, and that puts an end to the inning, but 11 Phillies back. Six score to turn this game around in the seventh. Well, a huge flip in this game in the top half of the inning. Six Philadelphia runs. And now the Phillies turn the ball to the bullpen, starting with rookie Ryan Madsen, 23 years old. He has had a fine start to his rookie year in the, out of the Phillies' bullpen. 
He'll face Kareem Garcia, then Jason Phillips, and Mike Cameron. And right now, a lot of the good feeling and life here taken out of the stadium with that Philadelphia inning. Mets hoping they can recapture some with the bats. Going against this 6'6", 190 pound right hand. As he rail thin as Garcia pops it up to right, one away. Well, Mets need some runners trailing by three runs here in the seventh inning. And as you mentioned earlier, they got to peck away right now. Jason Phillips is getting hot with that bat. Now Phillips robbed of a home run by Burrell in the second inning. And then has responded with a couple of singles, scored a run. Madsen's curve for a strike. Madsen is a terrific story, this young guy. And I heard the story, and I checked it with him last night, and he confirmed it. Grew up in Southern California. And his father, who was not a coach, was a businessman. His father would never let him throw a curveball in Little League. He never threw a curveball, he said, until his junior year of high school. And here he is pitching in the big leagues. Now, there's a lesson there, youngsters. Yeah, develop an overpowering fastball. Don't worry about anything else. Well, as, well, as he said, a fast. What he said is a fastball that you can control. That's right. That I learned to control, and then I learned a changeup, which is, I believe that was it, wasn't it? That was a nice sinking changeup. Yeah. Watch the action on this pitch. That's a nasty pitch right there. It was only 81 miles an hour, so I've got to believe it was a changeup. Yeah. Now here is his motion, as you see the big, lanky right-hander with going right after the hitter. Opening up. But you do learn if you throw that one pitch off, whoa, if you throw it all the time, you're going to learn to control it. As I mentioned earlier, Tom Glavin, that's what he did. He said, I can control that fastball. Yep. I'm going to throw it. Mike Cameron has walked, struck out, fly to fairly deep center field. Well, that ball, nasty movement Ooh. in on his hands and a pretty impressive inning. Madsen puts the Mets away very quickly and will go to the eighth. 6 3 Phillies. Jimmy Rollins starts the eighth, followed by pitcher Madsen in the on deck circle, and then Glanville. Rollins 0 for 3 tonight. David Weathers continues on relief for the Mets. Off day again tomorrow, so anybody that works tonight has a chance to rebound before the series in Florida. Now two and one to Rollins. Now the Marlins won tonight. A shutout win in Cincinnati ended the Reds winning streak. Looks like the Braves are going to win. <clears throat> Owner Jack McKee and Joaquin Griffey Jr. All right, I should say Sean Case, King Griffey yeah. Jr. hit the home run and right. was glaring into the dugout. Well, Junior's starting to swing. He's this starting to look first, like Junior of old. First hot streak. He's closing in on 500. Which people forget. There's a ball to Rollins, three and two. Don't forget that somewhere here. At in the next month to six weeks, we should likely have another 500 home run man in Junior Griffey. Everybody at this, well, a few years back was projecting he'd be at 600 yeah. or 650 by now. Barry Bonds last night hit his first home run in the month of May. After hitting 10 in April. 669 in his career. <laughs> takes and that's ball four so lead off walk of course all that baseball action to be recapped along with the other news of the day on sports desk presented by Toyota coming up right after our game on MSG that's it now will bat may well be asked to bunt well here's this unusual move 
not this, but what's unusual for pitchers, he offers it that for a strike. Right hand pitcher, left hand batter, leaving his pitching arm exposed. Well, most of these pitchers were good hitters when they were playing amateur ball, and they probably played other positions, so they accepted the whether they batted right handed or left handed without much thought, and then all of a sudden they become major league pitchers, and as you mentioned, they have. <laughs> The pitching course, arm exposed. Of course, they become professional players and they never hit. That's the problem. Right. Even in the minor leagues, a lot of these guys don't hit. Yeah. Only when they, if they make it to the National League, are they required to be full time, even in the minor leagues in some matchups, DH is used. Madsen puts the bunk down. The two strike pitch. Beauty. Weathers throws him out. Well, Philly's trying to get that extra run. It'll give him a four run lead here late in the ball game. We're in the eighth inning. Mets had that lead. They had a three nothing lead up until the seventh inning, and the Phillies scored six runs at the top of the seventh. So here at the top of the eighth, they want to pad that lead at least with one run going to the bottom of the inning. Glanville, the batter. Phillies and Marlins in a virtual tie for the division lead starting this night. And which the Marlins won in Cincinnati. And Jack McKeon. We talk about a captain hook. Pulled Darren Oliver out of the Marlins rotation before the Mets ever saw the Marlins this year. And tonight, Tommy Phelps, a reliever, made his first start. Seven innings, one hit in Cincinnati. No runs. Sounds like he's got himself another start. Well, it, they're also getting ready for A.J. Burnett. Yeah. They think Burnett could be back in a couple of weeks. Big swing there at the breaking ball. They feel Burnett has the biggest upside of all those young arms. Landville looped a single to center to drive in a run during the seventh inning. Fouls this out of play, one and two. Cubs in Houston tonight. And uh, the Cubs are starting to, I think, show the effects of not only playing without Mark Pryor, but now Kerry Wood and Sammy Sosa on the DL. And there's what's happening tonight. Andy Pettit started that game, but he's out in the sixth inning. And it's Greg Maddox getting hit tonight for the Cubs. Right side by Glanville. McEwing makes the play, two down, and Rollins goes to third. So Glanville, with he doesn't drive him in, he wanted to move him along, but with one out, you want to drive him in. Glanville going to the right side, grounding out, and leaves it up to Chase Utley to swing that bat and drive in the run from third base. David Weathers usually gets some pretty good control. Doesn't get into the dirt that much, so I don't think you really have to worry about his wild pitch or a pass ball. You always have to worry about a pass ball. Well, this is where the catcher's in, right? You got to trust your catcher. Trust your catcher and not be afraid to throw the ball That's down exactly in the right. strike zone. If you throw a breaking ball, the catcher's got to anticipate in the, in the dirt as you look at Feliciano and Moreno throwing in the bullpen. Takes ball two. Utley tonight one for four. It was his sharply hit ground ball off John Franco in the seventh inning that was right to Mike Piazza. Mike started, uh, or Mike tried to turn what might have been a double play, although it would have been interesting to see if Franco could have beaten Utley to first base. But Piazza turned and fired the ball wildly to second base, threw it into left field, and that was the the back-breaking play of the inning. I thought John beat Utley to first base. Did he? Just a, yeah, it was just a matter of Matsui catching that right. ball and throwing it to first. Of course, Matsui couldn't catch it. It was thrown well over his head. No, it was yeah, no chance for him. He said it was a sh sharply hit ball, which is why I thought the Mets would yes. have had a chance. It was a, a one-hop shot, but right to Piazza. Yeah, John got over there in a hurry. Here's the... Error in the seventh inning we're talking about. Sharply hit ball. Yeah, he came up through the ball hard to second base. And 
and just threw it too high into left field. And the Phillies ended up scoring six runs in the seventh inning. And Utley pulls that one on the line right to McEwing. And David Weathers gets through the top of the eighth. So on we move to the bottom of the eighth. The Mets needing three. Stepping to the plate is you. The 2005 Mets Fantasy Camp wants you. Suit up and play with the pros in a five-day intensive baseball clinic. Learn the fundamentals of hitting, fielding, pitching, and base running. Step up to the plate and live your dream. For information, call 718-559-3035. Call today and be part of the team. All right, John, thanks very much. Again, Sports Desk comes up after our game tonight. Game it took a rude turn for the Mets when the Phillies put up six in the seventh. Now they stay with rookie Ryan Madsen for a second inning. The way he threw last inning, I'm yep. sure Larry Bow would go right down the line with him. But he does have a, a he's big, tall, lanky yep. right hander with a funky motion. And he's uh, it's interesting. He works almost not quite as far over it as Tom Glavin, but very much to the third base side of the rubber, and he falls off that way. Very stiff front leg landing. Well, the Phillies would, would tell you the past few years, as you look at that last pitch, what they were trying to do is build their ball club for the new ballpark. Yep. Try to get some talent in there, some power in their lineup, some pitching. That's a nasty pitch right, right there. Ooh. So you see the Mets are just all, it's the first time they've seen this kid, and they're just, the hitters have no clue right now. You can see the swings, and it's because of this, can we say, funky delivery? Yeah, perky jerk. Yeah. At the lap. Look at this. Sling, Arms. and then a slingshot, almost like a, not a slingshot, but a catapult. Almost, yeah. Right? The way he throws the ball. And, and, and it's, uh, yeah, like that. We, yeah. We could say it's <laughs> unorthodox. <laughs> that made sense, didn't it? <laughs> It is. It's almost like a, the arm is almost like a lever, and the body comes all the way through with the with the uh, motion. And then the arm is the last thing, and it just catapults the ball. It's like the old pitching machines, right? Tough play here, and David Bell can't make it. Wigginton is on, leading off the bottom of the eighth. Second hit tonight for the Met third baseman. Oh, they get Joe McEwen on. They had the double switch. You know, sometimes the double switch is overused, but let's see how it works out as you look at that play again. Ty Wigginton beating the throw to first. Now see if Joe McEwen can deliver. He went in in the double switch. Again, another look at Ty Wigginton beating the throw to first. You get Kaz Matsui on deck. Go right to the top of the order after Joe McEwen. I could not agree more with that statement. The double switch, I think, can be very overused. And, and right now, I, you know, I sincerely feel that in certain cases, if you put the player in that's better than the player you're taking out, it's understandable. Absolutely. You have to ask yourself, what hitter do you want on the plate? Absolutely. And we'll see here now, Joe McEwen gets a base, hit the double switch, right. work in the favor of the Mets, or just get on. 2 0. I mean, there, there, obviously, there are times when the double switch makes sense yes. in, a, in a dramatic lineup move, but. In this case, the double switch was for two spots in the lineup. Great looper. Heading up the Mets bullpen. There's a strike. Jim McEwing. Philadelphia native, grew up a Phillies fan, finally hit a home run. The vet last year, just before the Mets, I think it was Mets' last trip there, in fact, when they hit the home run. Yeah, and they knocked it down. So he's got to tell his grandchildren and children, you know what, I hit a home run there. Where the cars are parked. Good pitch again. You, you could tell this kid, his dad didn't let him throw curveballs. And it made him learn to change. That's a great changeup he's got. I mean, he is just that nasty man. Changeup is making a comeback, and it should because it's a lot easier on the arm than the breaking ball. Two and two. Just watch John Franco and Tom Clavin. Full count to McEwen. Well, the Mets have a little hope here if they can get McEwing on. Get the tying run to the plate, Cormier in the pen. That's a 
Shane Spencer and Todd Zeal on that bench available to hit. Spencer getting ready. Struck him out. That's a big pitch for Madsen. He came all the way back after falling behind Joe McEwing and makes, look at it, all movement on that pitch. Ball running down and in. So Matson beats Joe McEwing. One out here in the eighth inning. Runner still on first base and Kaz Matsui. Full hit. Still, if Matsui can get aboard, you get. Power hitter with Spencer to the plate as the tying run. The Phillies are getting Cormier ready for a potential rematch with Cliff Floyd. That's like to see this inning get that far. Matsui has scored two runs tonight, reached on an infield hit in the third, and was intentionally walked in the sixth. Correct that for those keepings where he has actually scored one run, not two. Who's that change? That's a nasty change up to Kazmat Silly. And of course, the Changeup is a compliment to his fastball. The fastball is in the 90s. Yeah. Then he really pulls the string. I'll tell you what, if you're at the Mets right now, you want every hitter to get up there against Madsen tonight. Because you're going to see this kid a lot this year. It's only the second of 19 games that these teams will play. Well, man, no, I mean, these are just no chance swings. Yeah. That's so he had no chance. That's well put. That's a nasty. You saw Joe McEwing get that ball down and in with a lot of movement on it. Now watch this pitch to Madsen as he. Throws the hook and gets Matsui. As he gets a fast, everything works off his fastball. He's got a real good fastball with good control. Now it's Shane Spencer. So my, my point, Franny, I mean, you want these, get your looks at him tonight so that when you see him next week in Philadelphia, yeah. the subsequent series, it's, it's you've had some experience with him. Because as you mentioned, you're going to see him a lot. And Mets will be in Philly next week. Hook to Spencer for a strike. So now the hope is that Spencer somehow gets on and Floyd would come up as the tying run. And this is for the Phillies crucial because if Spencer is retired, then neither Floyd nor Piazza can beat the Phillies. Spencer gets on. Of course, Floyd has a chance as the tie. Two balls and a strike. Look with that fastball, we see it at 89. What does it look like to the hitter? Well, because after of those changeups. Yeah, oh, it looks like about 150 after those changeups. He features an excellent off-speed pitch. Just foul. 2-2 two -two now. And plus that funky motion. You know, it's funny, Ted, as you know, you look at pitchers today, it's almost like cookie cutter. They have that controlled motion. Look at the motion. And as, as you described that arm, the body's way out in front, but the arm does catch up. Two and two. job by Shane Spencer as he delivers his second pinch hit of the year and it does get Cliff Floyd to the plate as the tying run. That's all you ask for. Get to the money men in the middle of the lineup and Larry Boa going to the bullpen might be doing the Mets a favor right now. You know something? I agree with you. Yeah, because this kid could some, agree more. He's throwing some nasty stuff. Shane Spencer gets him knocked out of the game. So Larry Bow is going to the pin because that's what the formula dictates. Sometimes you just got to stay away from the formula. Meanwhile, it is 
40 years ago that became the symbol of the World's Fair when it opened here in Flushing Meadows. That wasn't there, that huge tennis structure, but of course Shea Stadium opened here on the other side of the fairgrounds that same summer. And they're waiting to, and they're hoping that shortly they can start on a new stadium here in Flushing, state of the art. Will remind a lot of the folks who remember Evans Field, a little bit of Evans Field, a modern day, as uh, Real Cormier gets set to go. Now, last night, Cliff Floyd got him. As Ted mentioned last night, I don't want to bring up a bad moment, but Ted did mention that body of work of 0 for 11. Well, it's a little bigger body now. It's 1 for 12, like you said. I give, once you get that first hit, you're on top of the world. And they call Frenchie Raoul Cormier from Moncton, New Brunswick, Canada. 37 years old to face floor. And One and batter likely with Piazza Luna. And we have talked about Cliff Floyd in the past, how proficient he has been against left-handed pitching. Again, it's the only thing the Mets could have hoped for here, just to get one of the bats, the big bats, a chance. Ball to Utley kicks it and Piazza will back. How about this? Bases are loaded with Mets. And after the initial shock of the Philly scoring 6 1, the Mets have the bases loaded for Mike Piazza. Larry Boa is not a happy camper. Ball is that's an E. And the Mets have made three of them. The Phillies have made one. We'll see how important that area is. As Larry Boa said, I'm going to go up, up there and get myself some roll aids. I need something to calm this stomach down. So there's, no, the odds. there's nothing an athlete who cherishes more than the chance for redemption. Now, Mike Piazza batted with the bases loaded in the sixth inning after the Mets had seen two runs score on walks and he struck out then a throwing error in the top of the seventh the key moment in a six run inning for the Phillies but now Mike Piazza gets the ultimate chance for redemption he bats as the lead run in the bottom of the eighth against a pitcher with whom he's had tremendous success and, he's, and the pitcher is staying in the box and I, I mean, he's staying in is Larry Boa around well there's nobody in the pen Larry's the reason he's staying out there. I think Larry walked up the tunnel. Now, the question is, with the storyline set up so beautifully for Piazza, can he finish it by delivering the big hit? And the other question, will he get a chance? Or will, or will this be a walk? I agree. You give up one run or you give up two, three, or four? Because Larry Bowen knows that the Mets will hit Todd Seal, but it's not Mike Piazza next. And I know this, what? Big, what? this may be the Buck Showalter, Barry Bonds play. I don't blame him. I wouldn't allow Mike Piazza to swing the bat here. Real Cormier hasn't come close yet. Larry Bowen sent Joe Kerrigan out there to tell Cormier, don't allow this man to juice one. That's exactly what this is. A pitcher now with the bases loaded. Fans don't, I don't believe the fans understand what's happening here, but this is exactly what Buck Showalter did to Barry Bonds in that famed game five years ago, except the catcher's not standing yeah. up. He's just not putting the four fingers So up. this is interpretation. This is an unintentional, intentional pass. It's absolutely oh. intentional. How about that? And it, give up one run, but don't give up more with Mike Piazza hitting. Well, the, the only way you beat the strategy, and, and, and anyone who's followed San Francisco baseball knows it for years, is the guy behind him has got to deliver it. In this case, it's Piazza's buddy that gets the chance, Todd Zeal. You know, really, I mean, Larry Boa could have showboated as a manager and had the catcher step off the plate or step out of the catcher's box four times with an intentional pass. But he opted to say, go out and tell him to throw four balls off the plate. And what you just saw is why all of the legislation that gets discussed about eliminating intentional walk is really nonsense because a team can just do that. 
There's only one suggestion. I just read this about a week ago. Bill James suggested you, if you really want to stop this, the manager of the Mets in this case should have the option of denying that walk. You walk Piazza like that, Art House should say, no, no, I, I, I don't accept the walk. Piazza, you hit again. Oh, that's I the only way, I'm serious, that's the only way that I've ever heard that makes any sense to stop, just decline the walk. Well, we just saw Mike Piazza really get an intentional pass. Now Zeal takes ball one. Now, if you were Art Howe, would you deny that walk? Oh, absolutely. You, it's interesting. Absolutely. Because now Todd Zeal bats, and a single could tie the game. That's fine, but I would have denied the walk. But Todd Zeal right now has become a very intelligent hitter, and he just tries to put the bat on the ball. Takes a strike. Zeal is two for nine lifetime against Cormier. Larry Bowen decided, as a look at Worrell warming up at the bullpen, he decided. We're not going to give Mike Piazza a ball to hit, and I don't blame him. Ooh. That one will not please Zeal or the Mets. This call. Well, take a look at it again. Leave it for glove, and it's outside off the plate. That, that, that's a crucial call. That is a crucial call. Yeah, it's one and two now instead of two and one. And if you're Cormier, you go right back there. Why would you come yeah, in? Absolutely. You're going to get, get that much off the corner? And they are. And he forced Zeal to swing that's out. See, well, that, that's how that's it exactly dictates right. the at bat. Exactly right. Unfortunately for the hitter, but fortunately for the pitcher, and that's the pitch that chases the bad ball. And the walk to Piazza works. On MSG, catch all the amazing action as they take it on the road to battle Jim Tomey and the Phillies. Mets, Phillies, Tuesday night, only on MSG. Mets. Ellen, what's become a very interesting baseball night at Shea Stadium in this eighth inning, which saw a crucial error open the door for the Mets, and the Phillies really deny Piazza the chance to hurt them. Shane Spencer stays in the game in right field as Braden Looper comes in to pitch for the Mets in the ninth inning. But, Fran, I, I think this is worth worthy of discussion is the, what the scenario we just saw with Piazza, who was, in essence, intentionally walked with the bases loaded. Bill James, in an interview recently, advocated allowing the batter's manager, in that case, to decline the walk. And in Bill James's scenario, what you mentioned, suppose you walk him again. And in Bill James' scenario, a second walk would advance each runner two bases. That was his scenario. But, but but and I want to get the rationale behind, which I did not know until I read this uh, interview with James. The Phillies will have a Abreu, Tomey, and then Burrow to face Looper here in the ninth. So they got all their money minute to play tonight against Looper here in the ninth inning. But Bill James said the walk rule was put in place in the 1870s to force pitchers to throw to the batter. He said to allow the rule to be used to avoid pitching to a batter is standing the rule on its head. And I did not know that the history of the rule was that. You, you asked the question, would a manager ever decline a walk? Bill James said the answer was clearly yes. If it's, if, it, if it's an advantage to walk, in this case, Piazza on purpose, then isn't it clear it would be an advantage for Art Howe not to allow it? Yeah, I would have declined the walk yeah. with him yeah. hitting. Not right. many guys would have declined the walk, but with Mike Piazza hitting, Especially in this ball game, I would decline to walk and let Mike Piazza swing the bat. So, Abreu leads off with a single. Now, Jim Tomey, who tonight has delivered two doubles, but the second one is the crucial tie breaking double in the seventh inning, and his stock on the rise brought to you by the New York Stock Exchange. 300 career doubles now for Jim Tomey. What an offensive threat he has been throughout his career, starting in Cleveland. Moving here to Philadelphia. Looper takes something off there, and it's one strike to Tommy. Mentioned earlier, he would be considered, as you look at Pat Burrell, he, Tommy would be considered a back foot hitter. When he winds up, all his weight is on that back foot. But he transfers it when he's swinging the bat, but when he ends up, it's all back on the back foot. Mind you, of a left-handed hitting Harmon Killebrew. Same type of uh, hitter. He would have been considered a back foot hitter.
runner going, and it is not in time. Phillips throw does not get there in time, and Abreu steals. Nobody at third base with Ty Wiggett to the started and running third base when he realized nobody was over there. Here it is again. Strong throw, but not in time to get a Abreu down there at second base with the sweet tag. Ty Wigginton, the third baseman, taking the throw now. If Abreu gets up, it's, he goes to third base if he br Ty, breaks right away. Yeah, the problem was that Ty Wigginton swept, but he didn't tag anything. He right. He tagged the dirt. Watch this. That's why, you know, I mentioned a few years ago with all Oops. the games on TV, the tag has become so important. Right, exactly right. You gotta apply the tag right there. He, in the old days, they were setting out because the ball beat him. But because so many games are on television, you've got to and, apply the tag. Right, and, and uh, Jerry Lane is right there. And he says, well, you know, he didn't tag him, he tagged the dirt. That's why the tag, it was something that it was. Somewhat insignificant in the scheme of things years ago has become extremely important where the umpire knows right. you're going to see all kinds of replays. So now Tommy will get put on and Burrow will hit. And the tag at second base, the slap tag is, is the best way to do it because you bring the glove down, you bring it up, and it's so quick, sometimes you can deceive the umpire. The sweep tag, the umpire sees clearly because it's a slower tag. for three with an intentional walk tonight. Earl five for 14 with a home run against Looper. Bottom of the ninth, the Mets will have Phillips, Cameron, Wigginton. Six, seven, and eight spots in the order. So if there's going to be any Met magic, it's going to have to come from the supporting cast. It won't be delivered by the middle of the order. Now three and zero to Burl. Last pitched on Saturday, picked up his seventh save. He's got a spot here. They're loaded up now with nobody out. David Bell, 0 for 3, sacked fly in the uh, seventh inning. He started the inning with a hard hit ball off of Matsui's glove. And then eventually brought the sixth run home in the inning with a sacrifice fly. Mets bring the infield in. Looper's uh, save on Saturday was the challenge where in a one run game Jeremy Burnett's began the inning with a double and Looper was able to get the next three hitters. Preserve a one run victory. Now he's going to get a visit from Rick Peterson. So Rick Peterson going out just to calm Bray Looper down. We talk about mechanics. Always difficult to talk about mechanics. During the course of the game, I get a kick out of it when a catcher tries to talk about pitching mechanics during the course of the game. You get to worry about calling the game. It's fouled by Bell. It's going to be out of play. One one ball. Down. It looked like it was out of the strike zone. Should David Bell realized that Braden Looper is going to try to get something in the strike zone. He's been wild. It's not a bad ball. High strike. I'm sure the other thing the Mets are thinking here is to get Looper an inning before the trip to Florida. Foul away. It's certainly going to be you know, there'll be some emotions for great Looper going back to Florida where it was part of the World Championship team last year. 
Facing a lot of friends. One and two to Bell. Fisted pop up. Tough play, but Wigginton gets there. And a foul ball for our number one. So Red Looper jams David Bell, gets him out. Bell with five home runs and 21 RBIs. Just takes a pitch that was a tough pitch to hit. And Weekly pops it up in foul territory. Ty Wigginton grabbing that ball. So the bases remain full of Phillies. Lieberthal doubled in the first run, the six run seventh for Philadelphia. This game right now follows a formula, to use your favorite word, Franny. It follows a formula that most people who study numbers a lot maintain is, is borne out, which is that the winning team in a huge percentage of baseball games scores more runs in one inning than the losing team scores in total. And that's the case tonight. What, what happened tonight, I think, is once the errors were committed. Six runs went up in the seventh inning. It changed the Mets' emotional state more so than anything. That's going to get a run in. May get in more. Nope. Cameron out there as that ball died in deep center. But Abreu will score. So Mike Lieberthal delivers the run that the Phillies gave the Mets when they walked Piazza in the bottom of the eighth. So right back. You look back to the bottom of the eighth thing, Mike Piazza was really intentionally passed with the bases loaded. You don't see it happen very often, but he was intentionally passed with the bases loaded. And the Phillies are able to come back and get that run back here in the top of the ninth inning. And Bray, you got it going. Base hit and a stolen base. So Jimmy Rollins will bat with first and third and two out. And that ground ball to McEwing makes the play. So the Phillies get a run. And they'll take a three run lead to the bottom of the ninth. Well, three outs away from a disappointing ride on home on the seven train for Met fans tonight. Mets had a lead into the seventh. But it's now 7 4 Phillies. And coming up right after our game is Sports Desk. So again, we'll hear from uh, St. Lucie Mets manager. That is an interesting ring to a Tim Tuffle. He'll give us an update from Port St. Lucie. Joe Micheletti will talk about the Stanley Cup Finals. Preview of the WNBA with the Liberty hosting Bill Lambeer's Detroit team. All that coming up on Sports Desk right after our Met game tonight. And on to pitch for the Phillies is Tim Worrell. Setup man in San Francisco for two years, including their World Series team, then became the closer last year for the first time in his career. Was a closer, did a magnificent job. He had 38 saves last year for the Giants, but Worrell was not offered arbitration by the Giants. They let him walk. He signed with the Phillies as a free agent, knowing he'd be going back to the setup role. Morell said once uh, he was not able to stay in San Francisco, which is what he wanted, he chose the Phillies because he wanted to go somewhere where he could win. Strike to Phillips, and it's two and one. Jason Phillips starting to swing a hot bat. Just missed a home run in tonight's ball game. Got his average up now to around 220. Mike Cameron on deck. It's one to well to right center field, but Abreu calls it. Here's the first out. Abreu taking charge out there. And Doug Glanville could have caught that ball, but gave way to Abreu. Cameron 0 for 3 with a walk tonight. A strikeout, a flyout, and a ground out is other at bats. Mike Cameron, the residual effect of this hand injury. We've seen him now go 
Just six hits in his last 56 at bats, and his average has slid to an even 200. We talked about it earlier that he and uh, as painful as, as it is, he has to give way to certain pitches. And after a period of time, he was going to forget the injury. But I'm sure Mike Cameron's well aware of that. As long as the manager doesn't forget the injury. Hopeful that Leiter will pitch in Philadelphia next Tuesday. Saw so, Al Leiter out here earlier today throwing out on a track in right field, throwing long distance with Vance Wilson as the other pitchers were going, working off the mound, covering first base. Al was out there in right field throwing with Vance Wilson and under the watchful eye of Rick Peterson. Larry Bow's emotions. He's unreal. Here's that pitch. Pretty Lieber thought. So I don't want to get hit with the ricochet off of Mike Cameron. But I'm sure this kills Larry Bow. With one out, you hit a batter. And you're then in the count. Now you face Ty Wigginton and then Vance Wilson. Two for four tonight for Wigginton. He has scored two of the four Met runs. Wilson has come out on deck to bat for Joe McEwen. The last met bat on the bench is Wilson. How's going to use him? Get the big boys. The ninth had a lot of saves last year against the six, seven, eight hitters. So that's precisely who he's facing here in the ninth inning. He strikes out Wigginton for the second out. And how important is that to Tim Morrell? Comes back and he gets Ty Wigginton with the fastball after hitting Mike Cameron. So Vance Wilson pinch hits. But Mike Piazza, the Mets' big hitter against Worrell, lifetime, is 8 for 15, three homers. Larry Bolo, well aware of it. Well, exactly. So how crucial is it that in this ninth inning that you know, Piazza likely will not get a chance? Well, the ultimate compliment, as far as I'm concerned, is with the bases loaded. And Larry Bowers did throw four balls off the plate. Yeah, absolutely. That is the ultimate absolutely. compliment for a hitter. It's happened to Barry Bonds, and now it's happened to Mike Piazza. The only difference is the catcher didn't step outside to catch the ball. All the way by Vance, and it's one and one. Think about that. Base is loaded, and the manager fears you that much where he says, walk. I'll take my chances. 
you know, it's funny. We were talking about whether or not Art Howe would decline the walk if he had the option. I don't blame Larry Bowen myself for that no. move one bit. If I'm in his chair, that's exactly what I would do. Uh, well, you know, the thing I mentioned before, which, which was impressive about Larry Bowen, he could have been a grand, he could have grandstand yeah. and said, okay, right. you know, walk him intensely. One and two to Wilson. I mean, we're, we are assuming they walked him intentionally. Larry Bowen could have taken that assumption right out of it and said, walk him, and um, if we win, the media will come to me after the game. Tell me how smart I am. But it was a good move by Larry Bowen. Nothing lead to the seventh. Now they are down to their final strike. And it's hit up the middle. Mm. Huntley with a backhand. And that does it. So the Phillies come back. And a six run seventh inning turns this one their way. The Phillies end the Mets' win streak at four. They salvage a split here. And they turn the game around psychologically with those six runs and a couple of key errors in that seventh inning. So the final at Shea tonight, the Phillies seven and the Mets four. We'll come back with a wrap up at Shea in a moment. Well, it was a night that started out in a promising way for the Mets. A terrific start from Matt Ginner, a 3 0 lead going to the seventh, and the Phillies changed it all with one big. Six runs, seventh inning, and win it seven to four as we look at our Toyota game summary. And the Toyota game summary reads like that. Danny Garcia and Cliff Floyd, RBI walks in the sixth inning. And you got Tommy, two doubles, two RBIs, Philly seventh inning, and that was a crushing inning for the Mets when the Philly scored six runs. And the key there, the two Met errors in that inning, costly errors as the Phillies came back and Beat the Mets seven to four. That was fact, only three hits in that big seven for the Phillies. So the team split a two-game series. The Mets take off. They'll be in Florida Friday night for the weekend, and then on to Philadelphia. And we'll next join you right back here on MSG Tuesday night from the new Citizens Bank Park in Philadelphia. Geico Mets on deck with Maddie at 6:30, and the game at seven next Tuesday. Stay tuned. Matt Burrell, 6-4-3, not enjoying his mini stay in New York this week. He strikes back, though, in the second here. Jason Phillips, drive deep left off Brett Myers. Burrell back to the wall and maybe takes away a solo home run from Jason Phillips, who's hitting the ball hard lately one more time. This probably would have cleared the fence. Phil's catch a break, bottom three, two on for Piazza. He'll turn on Brett Myers' pitch. Does this have enough to get out? Mike rockets it. Deep left. No. Off the top of the wall. Missed a homer by about half a foot. Kaz Matsui home on the Piazza RBI double. Mets are on top. We go bottom six now, and the Mets have runners on second and third. Two out. Boa intentionally has Myers walk Matsui. That loads the bases. Danny Garcia next. And what do you know? Myers on four pitches. Walks him. Jason Phillips home. It's a 2-0 Met lead. Roberto Hernandez replacing Myers. And he walks the first battery faces. Cliff Floyd, Ty Wigginton home, 3 0. But maybe the crucial at bat of the ball game comes up here. Mike Piazza, bases loaded, chance to blow it open, and Hernandez gets him to reach. The rally ends there. And to the top of the seventh, as John just said, the fun begins for the Phils. Ricky Vitalico starts the inning. David Bell leads off. Ground ball too hot to handle for Kaz. They score at E6, and the Phils start to get cooking now. Mike Lieberthal is next. Shot. Over Wigginton's glove. That's trouble in the left field corner. Bell will score on the Lieberthal double, and the Phillies are on the board. This makes it a 3-1 game. The net bullpen shuffle continues. John Franco replaces Batalico. Doug Glanville now will serve this one into center. It'll drop in front of Cameron. Lieberthal, come on home. Now it's a one-run game at 3-2. Next up is Chase Utley. One out. Bouncer to first, Piazza picks it up, think and double play, throws it into the outfield. Over Matsui's head, Jason Michaels home of Piazza's seven errors this season. Four have been at first base. Game tied at three, Stanton on to stop the bleeding. Instead, deepens the wound. Jim Tomey drive down the right field line. Glanville and Utley each come on home. Phillies with the lead for the first time in the series. It's 5-3.
Bottom eight now. Bases loaded. Down six three. Royal Cormier. They unintentionally, intentionally walk Piazza. He gets nothing to hit at. Phils will settle for that. Bases loaded. Walk. Now it's a two-run game. Mets are down 6-4. Todd Zeal off the bench to pinch hit. And Cormier gets him. The threat is over. The Mets go on to lose it by the score of 7-4. This after they get another quality start out of the starting pitcher. This time, Matt Ginter, six shutout innings. He scattered four hits, a walk, and a strikeout. And the Met bullpen in that marathon seventh inning that ended a streak of 28 consecutive shutout innings by the staff, the team's longest such streak in 14 years. To the way it was two nights ago. Phillies and Marlins atop the division. Philly actually three percentage points ahead of Florida. The Mets three back, back to 500, and they are not as good on Jose Reyes. Absent from the St. Lucie Mets lineup for a second straight game, he will not play tomorrow night either. As a matter of fact, the Mets sent him back to St. Lucie before tonight's Florida State game at Clearwater. Still feeling the effects of a sore back, the Mets maintain this setback is not related to the hamstring injury that put him on the DL March 26th. Nevertheless, Tim Tuffle, the St. Lucie manager, disappointed about this turn of events. I think uh, everybody, everybody in New York, uh, front office was excited, and uh, you know we were excited to having Ray Ray in the lineup. So uh, when when he pulled up tonight uh, with his back being stiff, uh, precautions were taken, and uh, you know we were warned about this and uh, that it could happen, uh, that this new stretching and and uh, working on his uh, hamstrings could could affect his back, and 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 right now he's just a little tight. So uh, we're just being very cautious with him because he's a. He's a, he's a commodity, and uh, he's an exciting player when he's healthy, and uh, uh, we'll get him again in the next few days, hopefully. The kid has a great heart for the game. Uh, he plays it hard. I've known him now for three years and uh, was the infield instructor uh, a few years ago with him as the uh, rover, and uh, he plays the game with a passion. He's exciting. He goes first to third, uh, almost like a Mookie Wilson type, and uh, uh, and, and I think we're all anticipating him coming back and putting on the uniform because, uh, you know, even though the Mets are winning, they, sh they sure would be an upgrade to have uh, Ray Ray at second base. Our Anthony Fucilli in Florida to monitoring the Jose Reyes situation. We've got plenty more to come on Sports Desk. Welcome back to Mets Inside Pitch brought to you by Mercedes. What's it like to spend a lot of years in the minor leagues? Is it worth the wait? Well, we talked to Shane Spencer about it. Major League Baseball is the ultimate goal for all baseball players. Nowadays, players come from all over the globe to play in the big leagues in America. And while their destination is all the same, each player's journey to get there is different. Shane Spencer's journey has not spanned the globe, but it was a long trip. For me, it was, I spent six years in rookie ball and A ball. And not a lot of people have ever done that and I made it. So for me, that's something special that nobody knows. And when they hear that, they're like, no way. Come on, six years of A-ball. And uh, I'm like, yeah, and they're like, what happened? I'm like, no, I never did bad. I was just stuck behind a lot of prospects. Shane's journey through the minor leagues was not over after those first six years. He then played double and triple-A ball from 1996 through 1998. But even before he began his long road to the bigs, he thought about getting off at the first exit. He thought about quitting after his first year in the minors. I remember coming home that, that off season, I was working out, think, contemplating on going to play football or JC in California. And, uh, I talked to Brian Giles and he said, no, no, man. He's like, believe me, I've seen all the other players. You can, you can, you can play, you can hit, just stay with it. And ever since then, you know, I'm like, I played with him my whole life. so. Uh, and that moment right there is when I decided I was going to go until they told me to stop. High school teammate and lifelong friend Brian Giles, now a San Diego Padre, encouraged Shane not to stop chasing his dream. Shane found inspiration from other areas as well. You know, it was always something like you couldn't do this or you couldn't do that. You know, made you strive a little harder. 
In 1998, Shane's hard work paid off, and he was called up to play for the New York Yankees. Then in 2000, Shane finally arrived when he became an everyday player. But then his journey took another detour. Having a great, great year, like, you know, sitting over 280, had like 10 home runs and 50 RBIs almost, and at the half time, at the break, so uh, having a good year, and boom, my knee goes out, and I knew it was hurt, but I didn't think I was thinking maybe four weeks, five weeks, but they told me the rest of it, you know, for a year, I'm like, oh, that was tough, and I've never been a starter since. Shane's numbers this season proved that he has fully recovered from his knee injury. And while Shane could have sulked about losing his starter status, he has chosen a different way to handle it all. I think now that I've been around long enough, I think I've kind of accepted it mentally. And I think that's a big issue, is getting over it mentally, like, oh, I'm not playing enough, or get over it, you know? That's what your job is, so I think once you acknowledge that, which I have this year, I mean, I've just been comfortable no matter what. I told Art that, that Hey, you want me off the bench, you need a platoon, you need to play left, right, I don't care, give me anywhere. You know, I'm ready to play anytime. And that's been big mentally for me and it's helped me out on the field. When it comes down to it, you can sit there and look at the stadium and look around and say, you know what, all these people are here and they can yell at you, but there's nine of us out on the field right now. The nine of us in Seoul State and they all came to watch these guys play. And that's, that means a lot. And you can just, okay, don't even worry about it. Have fun and enjoy this moment. In 2000, in a game against the Dodgers, the Mets trailed 5-4 in the top of the ninth when Todd Pratt was brought in to pinch hit. Pratt's grand slam put the Mets ahead and they went on to win easily 10-5. That was this week in Mets history. Two pitch, popped it up on the left side of the infield. Matsui is there waiting for it. Matsui makes the catch and the ball game is over. Tom Glavin at age 38 has thrown his first ever one-hit shutout. He throws his first complete game and his first shutout as a Met. He came within four outs of a no-hitter, but Glavin settles for the one-hitter, his first ever. Welcome back to Mets Inside Pitch. Once again, I'm Fran Healy. As promised, my special guest, Tom Glavin. Tom, coming off a one-hitter. I know I, I had the luxury of being involved in a couple no-hitters. Around the sixth inning, I know as a catcher, you start to think, geez, I'd love to see this guy throw a no-hitter because it's going to make me look good. <laughs> Forget the pitcher. But when does the pitcher think about it? Um, you know what? I, I mean, I think I thought about it all the way through, but I didn't start taking it seriously probably until the fifth inning. You know, um, I remember, I remember going through, after the third inning, sitting down, kind of going through where I was in the game and realizing, all right, that was nine up, nine down. And kind of trying to, in my mind, manage how the next inning was going to go or the next couple innings, trying to, you know, manage the lineup and do all that stuff. And, you know, I thought, okay, well, if I get through the next three innings, you know, nine up, nine down, we'll be in good shape going into the latter part of the game with relatively good pitch count. So, I mean, I kind of knew it, obviously, but I didn't take it seriously until I walked off the mound after the fifth inning and it was if not pretty close to a standing ovation, everybody was getting real loud. I thought, okay, everybody's kind of realizing what's going on here and they're starting to take it seriously. So uh, I think that was the point in time where it, it kind of started to, to play on my mind a little bit. I felt in catching a no-hitter that, uh, especially in a close ball game, in the game obviously you want to win, that defensively, you're always serious about your defense, but there's even a special edge to your defense in a, in a game like you pitched the other day. Can you, you feel it? on the field that defense, the different edge to it? 
Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, everybody kind of gets caught up in it as well. And, and, you know, I mean, everything goes on. And, you know, from guys not wanting to talk to you to not sitting next to you to not, you know, everybody, nobody wants to jinx you. Uh, and the same carry, when they get on the field, you know, guys guys want to make the play. They don't they don't want to be the guy that, you know, if the ball's hit to them, they don't make the play. So, yeah, they're everybody's kind of on their toes a little bit more, uh, anticipating that if the ball comes their way and they've got to, you know, lay out and make a dive or run through a wall to try and keep it going, they're going to do it. And, yeah, you kind of sense that everybody's on their toes defensively a little bit more. With all your success, all your experience in the major leagues, was your nervous system activated in a more rapid fashion during this ballgame? Yeah, I think so. Because.